So, uh, good morning, everybody. So there are new faces in the room, so I'm going to uh, follow Senator Campion's uh, suggestion. If people just introduce themselves, we'll go around the room as we change topics. We, we change casts sometimes, so we're on plastics, and people just say who they are. And if you're here formally representing someone, if you could say whom you're representing. I'm Jen Holliday. I'm with the Chickens All the District. I'm Jack Thurston. I'm a reporter at New England Cable News and NBC Boston. Welcome. I'm Linda Petter, representing myself and a group called S Sustainable Williston. Ryan Forrest from Sustainable Williston. I'm Hans Mansky with the Crassing Group. We represent SWIGMA. Heather Schulweiss, William Schulweiss and Associates. We represent Technoflex. Brad Brad from Technoflex. Lynn Levins, also from Sustainable Williston. Kathy Jameson, Agency of Natural Resources. Matt McMahon with MMR uh, representing the theater owners of New England. William Northrup with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Lindy Sargent, part of Vermont, uh, representing myself and also Young, which is an organization up in the kingdom concerned about the landfill expansion. Uh, Phil Rosensky, I'm representing the American Progressive Ag Alliance. Uh, Frank Stanley, Capital Connections, <coughs> representing uh, the American Progressive Ag Alliance. Uh, Brian Campion, State Senator of Bennington County in Wilmington. Mark McDonald, uh, Mark McDonald, uh, Orange County. And my name is Chris Bray. I'm uh, representing Asset County, and this is Julie McCart, County Assistant. All right. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're getting started. Well, uh, picking up on S one thirteen, two million plastics bill, and. Um, a lot of exciting information to work through. Uh, the goal is to be voting this bill out this week. But given the work we've already done, I think we're probably on the track to do that. Um, <coughs> we've been, uh, we have a long witness list, so let's jump right in. Let's invite Ms. Jameson to join us at the table. Um, for we've heard um, background information and sort of uh, bits and pieces, but we really want to back up and tell have a clearer picture of how the proposals we have in the bill fit into uh, the whole ecosystem of managing waste systems and um, things that you would want us to, to know and keep in mind as we uh, edit and develop the bill further. So good morning. Thanks for coming in. Happy to do so. For the record, I'm Kathy Jamison. I'm the Solid Waste Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, thank you. Um, the agency appreciates the opportunity to comment on the bill today. Um, and to be forthright, the administration position on S113 uh, um, as it is, um, is neutral. Um, today, I would like to share with you uh, background and factual information regarding. Just one second, we just uh, okay. periodically, we more often than not, we've hear, heard that the administration's position on things is neutral. And I had never heard that from another administration in the past. And so what does that mean exactly in terms of what we could expect? Does that mean that it could be vetoed, it may be signed? Can you yeah. give us some indication? Um, so at my level, and yeah, hopefully please, you please. understand and that. And I know, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So my, my understanding is that, um, that, that it would not be opposed to okay. the bill as it is today. Um, if something's not opposed, somebody would support it, but this is neutral. Neutral. Okay. Right. okay. That, that's my understanding. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and happy to provide background information regarding um, single-use bags, um, changes that we are now having and experiencing in the recycling market, uh -huh. and then potential options that the committee may want to consider in, in, in developing this bill. So if I may, yes. right in. Thank you. Um, for so you've try. heard some background information already about plastics and whatnot, and I know there's a lot of people to testify today, so I'm going to try to stay at a high level. Um, we have, um, I had staff um, dig up lots of detailed information. I'm not sure you have the time for all those details today, but we can certainly um, be happy to provide details whenever the committee wants. But I'd like to share some, you know, high-level information about single-use bags first. Sure. And if you have information you think we ought to get, please send it over to Jude. We'll post it, and mm -hmm. uh, people can read outside of committee time. Okay. Yeah, certainly. 
Um, so originally, um, many countries, um, and then in the United States, counties and cities uh, originally were concerned um, regarding single-use plastic bags due to visible marine litter along coastlines. So, so if you look at how this ha issue has evolved, it evolved at you know in places like Hawaii. California, uh, you know, you know, coastal states or cities, and then countries that have coastlines. Since then, as you have heard, um, it has emerged trying to address other potential issues, including systemic potential ecosystems issues, the um, the vast increase in the amount of plastic waste that is generated, and then uh, resource conservation issues. Um, so I'm going to start with the resource conservation issues. Um, you've heard um, from others and may hear again today about um, a term called life cycle analysis. And that's when um, an, an evaluation is done over the, what they call the life of, of a product from uh, looking at the materials when it's first um, you know, either excavated or extracted, produced, the items produced, transported, the consumer uses it in the end of life. So when you're comparing you know, different bags, single use bags to durable bags, um, the most important assumptions in these evaluations are how often a durable bag is used and the recycled content of a durable bag. So if you just compared, like let's say, and no one would do this, but you used a durable bag only once and you compared that to a single-use plastic bag, well, there's a lot less energy used in creating a single-use plastic bag because it's really thin and it's easy to transport and whatnot. But what's important to consider is how many times you use the durable bag. And the more times you use it and the higher recycle content, um, eventually it will have less environmental impact than a single-use paper uh, plastic bag. The other considerations beyond life cycle analysis, though, are the negative environmental impacts that you have heard about single-use plastic bags. These are not considered part of the life cycle analysis, and let me explain. So the end of life in a life cycle analysis is assuming proper management, so that the bag is either properly disposed, properly recycled, or for the very few that could be composted, composted. Um, and as you have heard, that a lot of these plastic bags escape into the environment. Um, they have been documented to contribute to, to litter, um, they don't degrade easily, or when they do degrade, they degrade into smaller bits and pieces that then have an impact to wildlife, especially aquatic um, organisms. And right now, there's a, a big question on the potential risk on the food chain consumption. Um, there's been documentation of obstruction to natural drainage ways, as well as man-made um, sewer systems, stormwater systems. Um, and they also cause issues in management at they, meaning plastic single-use bags, um, in solid waste facilities, such as our, um, and you'll probably hear more about that today, at our, our recycling facilities where the, all the blue bin items go to be managed, um, that um, they cause clogging and that the system has to be uh, sorry, shut I mean, down. Pause, we'll, we'll just pause for a moment, so. Electronic device singing. So, so plastic bags, as well as other plastic film, um, clogs up the recycling system to the point it has to be shut down and, and staff have to go in there. It's a dangerous job and cut out the plastic in order for the machinery to run again. Um, a couple years ago when I testified on this, I contacted Chittenden Solid Waste District. They reported to me that um, in a year, um, 780 staff hours were spent cleaning um, plastic film off machinery. And that's downtime for the MRF, and expense and danger for the staff. Um, at landfills, if, if plastic bags are disposed, um, if, if it's a windy day, they can easily get away um, from the open face of the landfill. And um, the perimeter of landfills are required to have fencing. Um, and, and, and staff at the landfill routinely, at least once a week, have to walk <coughs> through the perimeter of the landfill picking up any of the litter in the most common item is plastic um, single-use bags. Um, with respect to how much is in our waste stream, um, we measure our waste by weight. 
And so um, considering how light a plastic bag is, when we looked at the waste composition study that we had done in 2018, uh, less than 1% of the weight of the material disposed in Vermont is um, single-use plastic bags. So it's not a big part of our waste stream when it actually is disposed, but it can cause all these other environmental issues. And um, the, the, the last reason about why um, um, entities are looking at um, um, ordinances or fees against bags is that um, reduction has the greatest environmental impact when you reduce um, using a material um, that's far greater in reducing energy consumption, water consumption, greenhouse gas emissions than compared to recycling. So if there's a, a reduction alternative, um, that, that, that by and large will have greater benefit. And looking at who is implementing single-use bags, this is not just a, you know, a hot, uh, what's the expression? Uh, but I don't right. Think, yeah. and this has been mm -hmm. ongoing for um, years. There are at least 65 countries throughout the world, including countries in Africa, South America, Europe. Um, in the United States, we have you hear, have the whole state of California. You've heard has adopted a ban with a fee on the on the paper bags. Uh, Hawaii did it in essence by every island adopting an ordinance. And there are more than 375 U.S. counties or municipalities that have enacted legislation or ordinances that either ban or charge fees on single-use bags. So what kind of programs are out there? Um, originally, years ago, voluntary programs were, were tried. Um, they were demonstrated not to be very successful. I think California probably is the best case study on that where there were multiple uh, attempts at voluntary programs. Um, they were not shown to be effective. That led to about 130 either counties or municipalities in California passing ordinances or bans um, that then eventually led to the statewide program. Um, as far as mandatory programs, they have um, docu been documented to reduce um, single-use bag uh, consumption. And in addition to the consumption, they have also documented a decrease in some of the other impacts. For example, San Jose, California, uh, the real impetus behind them passing an ordinance was it was clogging up their drainage, their man-made drainage system. And they documented that within a year of passing the ordinance, they had a 89% decrease in the maintenance that they had to um, use in maintaining these drainage systems. On the East Coast, an example is Mon um, Montgomery County, Maryland, um, where the impetus there was in litter, and they documented more than a 55% reduction in plastic bags in the litter within the first year. Um, you've heard about the different models, and just to summarize, uh, that the models that are out there, they're basically um, bands, fees, and a hybrid. And a little bit about each one. Um, a ban, generally, uh, the retailer is not allowed to provide that type of single-use bag to the customer. Um, some of these programs will specify um, ha uh, the, either the material thickness or the type of the reusable, durable bag. And there are um, 135 US cities and six counties that ban only single-use plastic bags. Um, there's a fewer number that ban both plastic and paper bags. Um, there are not as many cities and counties in the United States that have a fee-only system. There's only a dozen cities that um, have a fee on both paper and plastic. And there's six cities that only have a fee on the single-use plastic bag. The most popular model used in the United States is the hybrid model. Um, it's used by more than 150 cities and counties in the United States, including the state of California. I think, uh, well, one of the reasons why it, um, uh, it's um, favored is that it allows the retailer to provide at cost a paper bag to the customer when the customer doesn't bring in a durable bag. One of the issues that's raised with um, if, if, if an entity decides to ban both um, uh, plastic and paper is the cost of the durable bag, especially on lower income people. 
but by having uh, a nominal fee <coughs> in the paper bags, um, if someone forgets the durable bag, they can, you know, for you know, five cents or ten cents or whatever that fee is, they can get a paper bag. And paper bags are generally um, they can be reused, you know, several times before you know um, they're they're no longer um, usable. Um, fees range um, in the in, in these programs from five cents to twenty five cents, with the majority using a ten cent fee per paper bag. All of these programs tend to have exemptions, um, such as for prescription, you know, bags used for prescription medications. Um, when you go into a hardware store and buy little bits of hardware, like nuts and bolts and screws, uh, bags for produce, um, and the like. So, and that's pretty common um, with all of these programs. That is generally it's at the either the checkout counter type bag or their carry out. Uh, industrial type bag that, that is being targeted. That's a quick summary on bags. I'd um, like to move on to recyclables, unless you have questions about bags. Sure, I just want to be interested to stay on your tour. And okay. I'll double back to the questions. Great. Um, so with recyclables, and then you've also heard about some other single-use plastic items, um, and packaging. Um, so the market really has dramatically changed um, since early 2018, and that's because China uh, changed their importation requirements, um, especially uh, targeting um, the content of recyclables. And in, even though in Vermont we were only depending on China for managing our mixed recycled paper, uh, the West Coast states in particular and, and, and other states were using China for managing a lot of the materials that go in the blue bin. What this meant was that a lot more recyclables ended up on the U.S. market. And um, recyclables are viewed as a commodity. They are a commodity. And so uh, economically, when you have a lot more material in the market, that tends to decrease the price of that commodity. And so we've had a, a dramatic um, decrease in the revenue from our recyclables, not only in Vermont, but nationally. Um, and this has caused um, recycling to cost more. And we recognize, um, both in Vermont, and then I'm also on, on conference calls and groups nationally, that we need to um, manage our recyclables differently so that they can be valuable inputs to manufacturing rather than um, trying to find a home for it. They should easily be um, used in, in making a new product. And Europe has been using this model for a few years now, and their goal, and they call it the circular economy. And the goal is so that products and their packaging are designed such that it will easily feed into manufacturing something new when the consumer is done with it. And ultimately, if that's implemented, you'll greatly reduce waste and the costs associated with managing waste. You will increase the value of the recyclables, which will make it a more viable system for recycling. And you'll provide manufacturers with less expensive inputs for manufacturing. So it's a win-win-win economically. And, and so um, we're recognizing in the United States we, we need to jump on that kind of model just to stay competitive. Uh, to say nothing about you know, may, trying to get to a more sustainable recycling system. Um, so we also, at the same time, in order to get there, recognize, again, both, this is not just in Vermont, but this is nationally. There's national discussions about how can we invest in our existing recycling infrastructure. And one of the huge challenges with that is we're trying to do it at a time when recyclables have, are worth uh, much less today than they were a couple of years ago. So that's the economic challenge with all that. So these issues, and, and, oh, and then meanwhile, if we look at our recycle stream, we are starting to see more and more packaging that is not easily recyclable. Now, you think about recyclable, that just means there's a market somewhere to reuse that material or use that material to manufacture something else, right? 
And so uh, we, we're seeing, you know, some of that film plastic or that the, the tri-level or tri-layered materials that, that that those materials don't easily have a ready market to be used, but they're becoming more and more common in packaging. So so we're 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 struggling with changes in packaging, the need to invest in our infrastructure and the recycling market. And what some states are now looking at to try to deal with these challenges is, is the recycling system altogether. And some states are seriously considering, le considering legislation for extended producer responsibility for uh, basically packaging and printed materials. And states, these states include Washington, Connecticut, and I believe Indiana. Um, so that's kind of the landscape of the recycling um, system and markets, and that, and that some change needs to happen in order to make the system more sustainable. Moving on to um, S113. Um, so um, as I understand it, that the bill would um, um, have a, a ban on certain plastic items in, in 2020, um, but over the summer of 2019, there would be a summer study. And one option, and the summer study right now, I think, um, <coughs> targets um, single-use bags, plastic straws, and polystyrene. So one option for the committee to consider is that there's a lot more material that we're dealing with in our recycle stream. Um, and, and then in also in packaging that's not easily recycled, and that uh, the, the committee may want to consider broadening the scope of the study committee to include um, packaging, recycled items, and single-use plastic to just make it more holistic. Um, with respect to who should be on the committee, um, Act 175 in 2014 had this um, solid waste infrastructure advisory committee, and that had, um, at that point in time, it was important to hear from um, the solid waste um, um, management entities, the districts, alliances, and towns. So there's um, several members from that group, as well as the private solid waste businesses that included the haulers, as well as um, the MRF operator. Um, we may also um, wish to extend this because it's the bag issue to, and I, th I think um, the Vermont Retailers and Grocers Association was already included in the bill. Um, as well as perhaps um, members of the, the House and the Senate, just to make it a comprehensive um, group. As far as what they could consider, um, it would be um, uh, options and recommendations on how best to reduce the use of single-use bags and other single-use items. And then with respect to recycling, um, you know, it would be good for the committee to also look at that with respect to um, how, sh how should Vermont better manage packaging and printed materials. Right. Well, I think, um, as I said in, when we started 113, it started with a bill, it was actually a New Jersey bill that I thought was the most comprehensive thing I'd seen. It was a good <laughs> starting point, but mm -hmm. conversations prior to the town meeting was great and since coming back suggest to me that that it was it's a bill that was helps get started but the packaging this is one of those things where you pull on a thread and you keep finding a lot more threads to uh, connect with and so packaging would be uh, it'd be great to take a, a sort of an ecosystem approach not just deal with the problem at the end of its um, cycle so um, on the circular economy um, Comment. Are we talking about are part of is part of the issue the quality of the recyclables? In other words, it becomes a more circular economy if the quality of the recyclable materials is increased. The quality is one part of it, you know. So that 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 um, you have when we talk, talk about contamination and recyclables, there can be bits of plastic in the cardboard and bits of paper in the plastic, etc. That's one issue, but the, uh, the other part of it, though, and more important part of it, is the design of the product and the packaging so it can easily, more easily, be recycled or reused or fit into a manufacturing scheme. And you need both parts of that to work. 
Um, can you say a little bit and remind the committee about the kind of extended producer responsibility programs we already have, like batteries or elsewhere? Sure, and um, I did submit a report at the beginning yep. of the year that had a table. And so we had um, a great collection um, success in materials that have uh, extended producer responsibility. And for folks that don't know what that term means, it means the manufacturer is, is uh, responsible for basically um, the uh, collection, transportation, and recycling, oftentimes, of, of the material, the product that they're generating. So we have pro programs for used electronics, um, paint, um, uh, primary batteries, uh, mercury-added products, and am I missing? Anyways, with those, um, and then I think there's a fifth one that I, I escapes. Hmm? That, yeah, that's in the mercury added products. So that's lamps, um, light bulbs, and thermostats. W with those products, um, there, once the, the program is implemented, we have seen um, much greater <coughs> participation in the collection. So we have higher diversion rate, which means that material is not going to the landfill and is being properly managed on the other end. Equally importantly is that the burden, the financial burden of managing those materials is, is um, on, the, on the manufacturer and it's up, the, up to the manufacturer on how that cost gets imported, in, incorporated into the product. And that makes it a more, um, you know, if it's in the cost of the product and it's kind of that product when you pay for it is then addressing its end of life issue. Instead of putting the, <coughs> the burden of some of these harder to manage um, end of life issues on on the menu, on, on the municipality or on the consumer, which may not have as many options for proper management, such as right right now, um, household hazardous waste is a very expensive program for, and, and the burden is on the municipalities <coughs> or the solid waste districts to have the events to in, in have the facilities to properly manage the, that waste stream. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for us to do better on solid waste. Yes, always. All right. um, so there, there's that old expression, stitching time saves nine. If you uh, anticipate the end life of a product at the time of design, manufacture, et cetera, does that end up, is it cost effective overall? I mean, do, you, do you look at the economics of it? In terms of you know, I think that, um, a better question would be: Would the would that be an enough of an incentive for the manufacturer to look at the economics of it? And that's hard hard to answer because some of the packaging that manufacturers use, they're they're targeting the consumer. They're trying to capture the consumer as they're cruising down the aisle in the store. And so, um, so there's a lot of factors that go into how a manufacturer selects the packaging. But it would be important for them to help pay for the cost of managing that packaging once it's discarded. Uh, any questions for Ms. James? Thank, Thank you, you as much. always. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is by uh, Ms. Holliday. Thank you very much. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me come and speak about this issue. My name is Jennifer Holliday. I'm with the um, uh, Director of Public Policy and Diversion Facilities for the Chittenden Solid Waste District. I go by Jen. Okay. Um, I'm also the Chair of the Vermont Product Stewardship Council, and the membership of the council includes all of the solid waste districts and the alliances in the state of Vermont. And we were formed back in 2008 to work on initiatives um, dealing with extended producer responsibility, as Kathy had mentioned. I love go going after Kathy because she talks about everything that I want to talk about, so <laughs> you're already primed. Um, so we have, um, we're, uh, the initiatives include legislation um, that we've worked on for batteries, paint, uh, thermostats, uh, e-waste, and fluorescent lamps in the state. And these programs are incredibly successful. We have some of the highest collection rates in the country on all of these products. So they've been very, very successful. 
So I want to um, comment on the elements of some of the elements of, of 113 and then suggest how this committee uh, continu can continue to work um, on lessening the environmental impact of single use plastic as well as other packaging using EPR as a tool. So um, the Chittenden Solid Waste District's mission is to reduce the amount of waste that's generated in Chittenden County. So that is our mission. And certainly uh, banning single-use plastic bags will result in a reduction of this material going into the waste stream and will help us accomplish that mission. Um, so that's just a fact. Uh, plastic bags are also, as Kathy had mentioned, problematic in the recycling stream. Um, even though there are collection containers for plastic bags at the front of grocery stores and other retailers, um, many consumers don't understand that, sus that that material needs special collection. It's not a problem in the Northeast Kingdom where we source separate. It all works perfectly. You're very special in the Northeast Kingdom. We understand that. Um, Just making sure everybody <laughs> understands that. <laughs> that, that <laughs> for the record. <clears throat> So, um, you say that every morning? <laughs> <laughs> even if we're not talking <laughs> about recycling, right? Right, <laughs> but so when you're talking about what we see when we go into the grocery store, that's are, are those, those are being recycled, yes, they are being recycled, they are okay, they are they are backhauled to uh, manufacturers that mostly make recycled um, plastic lumber, okay. Um, they don't go to us, that we don't recycle them, they're, they're a different system. And so consumers don't always understand that. Not many bags get recycled that way and oftentimes consumers think their plastic bag belongs in the blue bin. And what happens um, to the blue bin materials for the majority of Vermont, not the Northeast Kingdom, but um, uh, the rest of the, the state is that it goes to one of two single stream MRFs in the state. One is owned by Casella, located in Rutland, um, and operated by Casella. The other is located in Williston. We own that facility. Uh, the Chittenden Salt Waste District owns that facility, and that is operated by contract by Casella. So one of two things will happen to that plastic bag if it ends up at the MRF, the Material Recovery Facility. Um, is that it will either get through the system and it acts very much like a piece of paper. And so what will happen, it will end up in the paper stream. And as Kathy pointed out, this in particular is a very difficult commodity for us right now to sell. In fact, we are paying somewhere between $30 and $40 a ton just to have it recycled today. And so when the plastic bag ends up in that bale, it is a contaminate, and it downgrades that material for market. And so they'll take other paper above ours if there's a lot of contaminants in it. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I, just, uh, Brett, please. <coughs> I just want to go back to what Ms. Holiday mentioned about plastic bags being recycled sometimes into plastic lumber. Yes. So again, I just that ends up, I suspect, eventually in the waste stream as well. It's not as though it can be recycled forever, right? I mean. Correct, but it's I think used and then it can deteriorate. Correct, and I don't know a lot about plastic lumber by okay. any stretch of the imagination. But my sense is that probably, when looking at life cycle analysis, because of the longevity of the plastic lumber and the products that you don't have to use to preserve it, perhaps that is okay. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They they continue to use them for decking and yeah. trim. And like, yeah. uh, for decking is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's but they, they, they also may, you know, as technology improves, may figure out ways to recycle that as well before it's done. That sounds good for like 50 years. It does last a long time. Yeah. And when it's harvested, do they have trip tickets on them? <laughs> So the other thing that can happen to these bags, other than contaminating the paper stream, um, is that, as Kathy indicated, it can get tangled up in the sorting equipment at the MRFs. So here's uh, uh, photos of this, this particular equipment. Um, what happens is things get, there's spinning disks that sort the material, and these spinning disks will 
um, get wrapped with what we call tanglers. And tanglers can be um, rope, hoses, mm. clothing, but as you can see in the picture, plastic bags are a big, big issue. And what happens when that, when that occurs, the equipment isn't as efficient at sorting material, um, and they need to shut it down, lock it out, and workers have to go in and hand cut all that material off of the star screens. And as you can imagine, that's dangerous and takes um, three to four hours of one person every day to do this. Um, so that's three to four hours you have to shut down that? No, so what happens is six people go in, but cumulatively it's three or four hours for a worker. It's quite disc mowers, too. What's that? Yeah. 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 It's people are paying us coffee. Yeah. Yeah. basically. Yeah. So those are the problems with plastic bags in the recycling stream. Um, and uh, as Kathy pointed out, I believe uh, plastic bags, if you look at plastic versus paper, the life cycle analysis of the two, actually paper, um, produces more greenhouse gas emissions than plastic bags, therefore, if the committee decides to ban plastic bags, consideration should be made to ban or place a fee on the paper bags as well to negate the overuse of paper bags and encourage the use of reusable bags. So I'd like to move on to polystyrene and other packaging. Just a question on, on paper. Is that the production of the, a new bag first time that increases greenhouse gas emissions associated with that one day, if you look at uh, recycling it, does right. it you know, improve the, the story? I don't want to it improves the story, but when you're looking at life cycle analysis, yeah. you're looking at the mining um, or harvesting of the, the raw materials, the manufacturing of that material, the transportation, and then the end of life, the use and the end of life of that material. So there's those, there, all of those are examined, as Kathy said, is assumed at the end of the life it's being recycled, but still paper is, uh, has a higher um, impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions to the environment. Senator Rogers? Do you figure how many times a well-used paper bag can be reused? I believe that analysis is for one-time use. See, and that's the issue, well-made paper bags. I've had paper bags, heavy duty with handles that are reused over and over, similar to a cloth or a heavy duty plastic reusable bag. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's not apples and apples, it's apples and oranges. Well, I think some people will reuse them and some people won't, and you can't assume that they're going to be reused. So that, that's, what, that's how it's studied. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, moving on to polystyrene food service products or poly expanded polystyrene or EPS um, is not recyclable unless the material is dry, if, unless it's clean, unless it's uh, collected in enormous quantities and then you have to put it through a process to densify the material in order to make it economically feasible to send it out of state basically for marketing. Um, and you have to keep it separate. That type of the food service is different than the expanded polystyrene that's used for packing appliances and um, electronics. So you have to keep those materials separate. Um, we don't think that collection or recycling of post-consumer polystyrene service products is currently feasible in Vermont for those reasons. Um, and alternatives for EPS food service products that are recyclable and co compostable do exist. Um, however, recyclability or compostability doesn't necessarily make it a better choice for the environment. And if there's anything that I hope this committee remembers that I say today, it's those words that recyclability and compostability of packaging doesn't necessarily make it the best choice for the environment. Once it's made and once we use it, recycling is the best choice. But when the manufacturers are choosing 
recyclability and compostability is not necessarily the gauge to measure that by. And unfortunately, <coughs> most of the global manufacturers are producing our products and packaging our products with that in mind because of the consumer demand. Because that's what the consumer sees is that packaging at the end of the life and they want and they're mad if they can't recycle it. But the reality is that you have to look at the whole life cycle analysis and um, from the, as I say, the mining and the production and the transportation and the use of that packaging to determine whether it's best for the environment or not because if we're all looking at environmental issues, the most pressing and urgent and, and serious issue that we have today in concerning <coughs> our planet is global warming. So you have to use the metric of greenhouse gas emissions for the whole life cycle of packaging. And a good example might be tuna fish. Tuna fish comes in a pouch and tuna fish comes in a metal can. And if you look at those two materials from a life cycle perspective, the, tuna, the, the pouch is a prefer, preferable, produces five times less greenhouse gas emissions, even if you recycle that can, than the can. What if it comes in a fish? <laughs> if it doesn't come with any packaging, it's the best. <laughs> Used, used to be in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, people, people grew their own food and put it in a glass jar that was reusable, and that saved the right. packaging. <laughs> so the, uh, Some of us, right? <laughs> so the, uh, you're saying recyclability and compostability are not the most environmentally uh, important criteria for designing uh, a waste system. So De designing packaging. Designing packaging. Yeah. And so what, what rises to the, what are the, what's the most important criterion or criteria from what you're saying greenhouse gas? Yes. Not making it. That's correct. Right? I mean, Reducing the amount of greenhouse right. gas emissions. So, so clearly no packaging is the best. Yeah. Um, and packaging that uh, generates less greenhouse gas emissions is, is, is better than others. So another example is um, mail order materials that come to your door, comes in a box or a film <coughs> envelope. Most times the film envelope is the best environmental choice, even though it's not recyclable in most places. Because of the energy in that The energy box, that The full light, the greenhouse gas impact. Correct. The carbon. Correct. Well, just a quick point. It seems it seems funny that we seem to be steadily going backwards uh, because when I was growing up, we did we raised a lot of our own food, we raised our own meat, and tons of people did. Um, but then we used to go to the people used to go to the grocery store and to the um, department store and get stuff. And as humanity progresses we appear to be doing worse and worse because now we get on Amazon and order something from way far away that comes on a truck and a plane and a bus and a train and it shows up in packaging uh, a big box full of plastic wrapping or styrofoam peanuts or you know you, you name it and so it sounds like uh, as I like to say humanity is circling the drain as we pretend as we pretend we're making improvements, we seem to be treating the earth worse and worse. Yeah, and just to add to that, I, you know, people, I, I was born in 1970, and that's plastic bags, I don't think were even around then. So people would bring their bags, right, to the market if they, didn't, if they weren't paper bags or, you know. So this is kind of going back to what people were doing that day. So we can't recycle away the problem. I know a lot of you thought I was born I in the 80s. <laughs> I was thinking 60s. <laughs> I was born in the 90s. Ryan, I can't be in the world. There I know you thought I was. So, uh, well, you know that the working group is uh, looking at how do we be, the, the narrow first question was, well, what, what might be <clears throat> plastic bag straws? Polycyte, but um, 
we keep on hearing about taking a bigger view. Mm -hmm. So if you were to help us think through what the charge to that working group would be, how would you design that working group to, to help Vermont make the most progress possible? So I would be, um, so that is at the end of my testimony, is, is a suggestion that the committee continues to work on this um, packaging and printed material um, by, by initiating a working group that develops an EPR packaging proposal that would be the basis of legislation for next year. And the proposal could include the scope of the packaging and printed material um, what the financial incentive would be for producers um, of printed paper and packaging to minimize the environmental impact, including greenhouse gas emissions, um, and how to structure the requirement uh, for producers to provide and finance the collection um, program, collection and recycling program. Um, including using the current infrastructure, because we do have a lot of good infrastructure, but um, for them to have skin in the game would be important as well. Can Vermont affect uh, commerce on a Vermont scale of, you know, through EPR? Yes. Well, if you're asking if, if we can change the minds of the producers and to, as to what they're doing, is that what you're asking me? Yeah, I'm just wondering you know, how. Uh, it's good for us to be ambitious, so when we see something that makes sense, like, uh, trying to re change the way we package so we create less waste to begin with, lower greenhouse gas emissions, stuff like right. that. Um, but I'm just wondering about the, how practicable it is for us as a small state. How far can we go before we run into uh, scale problems? So, um, California doing something like this, for instance, it always helps us when it's a with 40 million people. Correct, is, yeah. Doing well, the same kind of work. I think Vermont's always been a leader. We've had, we had the first EPR program for batteries, and, and we're, we're a leader in, in a lot of our EPR programs. And other states look to our models when they're looking at legislation. So in that respect, I think it would be great for Vermont to move forward, even though we as a population may, might not be able to move the, the, the needle that much. I think other states do look to us. And, and just in terms of EPR for packages, I just wanted to share with the committee that um, you know this was pioneered. EPR for packaging um, happened in Europe over 20 years ago. And today, there's 34 European nations, 11 countries in Asia, South America, and Africa, and, Austra and all of Australia. There's five provinces in Canada that have EPR for packaging. So this isn't new. And in fact, in Vermont, um, we intro did introduce a bill back in 2011, H218, that was EPR for packaging. Um, Rhode Island and Connecticut followed several years later, and today, as Kathy mentioned, there are three states with several bills that are in play, Washington, Massachusetts, and um, Indiana. So uh, it's not a matter of if, it's when and how. And what I am concerned about is that all of these states and some of these other countries, <coughs> many of these other countries, really look at the end of the life as the metric for measuring what's preferable in packaging. And so the funding mechanism is, is, or the financial incentive is set up in a way that influences manufacturers design for recyclability. And whereas a society, we really need to be looking at designing material that has less greenhouse gas emissions. And so back to the polystyrene packaging, if you look at the alternatives for polystyrene foodware, um, there is recyclable and compostable packaging, but some of these materials have a greater cost in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and so that if the intention of that ban is to benefit the environment, you're, you, that, then um, you're potentially not achieving that. Um, the, the schedule for that, um, in order to make crossovers and keep the bill alive, to right. Subject moving uh, is this week, and uh, certainly what you were saying and what Jameson was saying, and we've heard some before. There's a lot of complexity to it, so it's not something we can 
sort out for ourselves in the next three days, but we can, I think, sort out how we ask that working group, what we ask them to take on. I think defining the problem is a reasonable thing for us to, to do. And I, yeah. I would think if you have language suggestions around how you would constitute that group and then uh, spell out the charge that would be given, then I think that would be great if you could send that out to the committee. We'll share it and okay. use that to you know, jumpstart our own editing and developing of what the working group would do. Absolutely. And I'm actually, that goes for that. anyone in the room. So uh, we're at that phase where we're helpful to get contributions. Okay. Um, any, uh, anything else that we didn't get to? We, I asked a couple questions. I think you jumped ahead. Did you skip anything you wanted to cover? No, that, that was my testimony. I have paper copies for everyone as well. So. Great, great. Thank you very much. Um, and if you can submit it electronically, I will we'll post it to Senator Rock. Just one more quick question about where is your recyclable plastic headed these days? Where's that market? The Casella markets all of our material, they but do, it's so. all it's all um, relatively local in around the east so in the United not States. Not a lot of it's going overseas, None like of it's a going lot of overseas. other places. But None of it's going overseas. Here. No, Thank you. just Appreciate the paper. It. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Moore, will you Moore? Here? No, he's not here. I thought it was the women. I don't see a kid. The students are right up here. Okay. Yeah. So, um, let's go on to uh, Mr. Brady. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. You came with show and tell. Yeah, yeah, I did. I brought some show and tell stuff. Um, really, uh, my name is actually George Brad, and, I, and I've been oh. going by Brad my whole life. Oh, okay. And uh, yes, it's confusing and it's terrible. Brad Brad, and it's awful. And uh, <laughs> I blame my parents for that. But anyway, it's. Uh, um, uh, I'm the general manager for a business unit at Technoplex called Commodore Technology, and that was a business that my family owned, and we sold to Technoplex last May. And so um, I've been around um, the plastic and packaging and, and foaming. I've been to trade shows and uh, every third year in Germany, here in the US. I've done a bunch of plant visits, and I know quite a bit about foaming um, plastics and so uh, my, comp my company, I'm not in government affairs, but my company thought that I would be a good person to just come and you know, talk about what this with you and I really appreciate um, the opportunity. Just so I understand, Technoplex makes what kind of product? Technoplex uh, makes, has um, six different business units and we make from um, very high tech medical tubing to foam, foam egg cartons. Yeah, and the business unit that I'm part of and that my family's business became part of is the Dalco, Dalco packaging. And um, I'm going to get into some of the, some of the products um, that we make here. And, and there's a couple of that. Sorry, one other question. Sure. So do you manufacture in Vermont or are you? No, we do not. The closest man with, um, a manufacturing plant that my father started is in um, Bloomfield, New York. So we're, I grew up in Canandaigua, New York, which actually looks a little bit like Vermont. It's a, it's a, be it's a beautiful place. Um, but we, we make two products that may or may not be considered as part of the ban. And so I just want to do a little bit of um, demonstration on, on, the, on the foam and the plastic and just uh, give you some examples. And because and, um, people my whole life have been telling, well, not my whole life, maybe the last decade or two, you know, telling me that what we make is terrible. And I say to them, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not, it's not terrible. So I've got a couple of things. Um, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, uh, uh, to the, to the, um, to these foam trays, you know, filling up the, the landfills. And um, in, in Vermont, plastic's 13%, polystyrene's 3% of the 13, so half a percent, and it's by weight. But this was an interesting thing that I did is I went and took this, foam tray and I cut a piece out of the center and I put it in a vise and I just left it there overnight mm -hmm. to kind of show what might happen to a foam tray if it's sat in a landfill with, I don't know, 20 feet of heavy stuff on it and all the air gets pushed out. And it's about a 95 
percent reduction in in thickness. And then uh, I just kind of wanted to show that you know this is this is how much plastic goes into making one of these trays. This is these are both 10.1 grams. So and and we're working on alternatives because you know what the market is telling us. The market is telling us we don't like this stuff, right? And so, as a company, we look at other stuff. So we're looking at this. You know, this is this is the amount of plastic that's in this one. This is 30.1 grams. I don't even think it'll take as much meat as this one. I don't even think it will. So that's it's a lot more natural resource, and people kind of kind of miss that. So this, sorry, just like to yeah. that. So the. the Foam one is expanded polystyrene. Right. And the clear is extruded. Is that, is the, that the, the process? These, these are both extruded. So you have an extrusion system and you make sheet, and then you make rolls, then you put the rolls through a machine, you heat the, the material, and then you you form it. And so this is formed with a similar similar equipment for these for these two. This one actually is it's PET. Um, PET, polystyrene, polypropylene, I don't know why it really matters. It might, it might matter to the recycling systems. Another thing I think that's um, a little bit interesting, right, is that these, these two are both polystyrene number six. If in my factory I made both of these products, I would pull the resin from the same box. These are not two different things. Mm -hmm. These are the same thing. One's been, um, got air, one doesn't. So then I get, let me see if I, I gotta try not to skip stuff. That's what I do, I skip stuff and I have to come back. Um, I, had a, I, had, I did have a note in here about you know, the low um, energy. So we, we our, our whole plant, everything, we're converting this from a plastic pellet to a foam tray for about eight cents a pound. So the electricity conversion cost in a single tray, 454 grams in a pound, 10 grams. So what are you talking about? Four, 400 trays? I don't know, 40? I don't know, it's tiny. The amount of energy content in conversion is tiny, which the reason I mention that is because some of the alternative products, it's not tiny, it's big. And that would be kind of the drawing. Okay, and so then this. Now, this is, you know, we don't make these, but it's just an example. That's three and a half grams, and this is subject to a ban. So this is, this is um, foam polypropylene. That's 10 and a half grams. So from, from an environmental perspective, you know, you ban something at three and a half and you replace it with something at ten and a half. Why do people want this at ten and a half? Well, because when I pick this up and I drink coffee in it, my hand doesn't get hot, I don't need to use two cups, and I can drive from Canandaigua almost to Albany and still have lukewarm, co lukewarm coffee. But what about this? That is much better. You, <coughs> Dunkin' Donuts, if you go in there, they you would agree they will this up. is going to be, this is really what people should be using. 100%. Right. Here's the right. problem. You go to Dunkin' Donuts, they'll pour the coffee into the cup, the cup into yours, and they'll throw it away. Mm -hmm. They have to. They, they, they can't not do that. So we could make that change. No, well, the sanitation. I mean, I know, well, I know. You can't be walking in with a reusable cup and no, handing no. it to somebody in a restaurant. No, but I'm saying I hand this to, to Capitol Grounds and other places in town, they fill it right up. I bet if the health department found out, they would be in trouble. Yep, I think you're right. I see somebody shaking their head no, but not you, but. Well, we I'm, just, say, yeah, I'm just saying, you can't it, be walking into a restaurant a change that we could maybe with make. something that could possibly contaminate other people's food. Okay, so here's another one. This one, I, I got this stuff near my house, so I didn't really get a chance to do what people in Vermont use, and it, I, I did see where I had lunch yesterday, they were sending take home and aluminum. <laughs> the, the environmental impact of aluminum is way up here, right? You gotta mine that stuff. The electricity, they, they co-locate aluminum plants at 
where there's big dams, where electricity is essentially free. Electricity doesn't travel well. If we'd have gone with DC current instead of AC current back in the days of Westinghouse, maybe. Uh, so, so these aluminum plants get co-located where there's lots of power. So this is a good one. 4.6 for the base, 1.6 for the lid. Just the lid for this one is more, <coughs> and this is not recyclable. It's got, it's, they got a polyethylene coating that makes them so that when you fill them with soup, they don't fall apart by the time you get, you know, can finish eating them. And then, I'm almost done. I don't have, I'm not going to take up tons of your time because this stuff so speaks for itself. Yeah, it's a good lesson. This is, um, this is here's three different egg cartons. Of course, this is the one that we make. I cut a piece out of this because I had a, I had another interesting thing here, which I'll share with you. I took a piece of the molded fiber one out and I stuck it in some water. And I took one of the polystyrene and I stuck it in some water. And I couldn't help but think, on the side of the road, when I go pick this up, I don't know, six months later, I'm probably going to pick the whole thing up and bring it home with me and neither of these are going to be litter. Um, this one, I don't know. I don't think it's as good. What's, what's the this, cloudy one? That's the, a piece of this. Oh. It's this little missing piece. By the way, I don't know. Is it bad to have the eggs go through with the molded fiber and recycling? I don't. I don't know that. Um, what I can say is this is, is the one that's better for the soil. In other words, if they both were left out for a long period of time. I don't think you. I don't know. This is this is paper fibers. Paper fibers, you know, occur, occur in, in nature. I don't know. If this is in in the water and fish are eating all these fibers, is that worse than if this is in water and they're poking at them? I, I don't, I, I'm not qualified to answer that. What I can say is this is 14.9 grams. This is 62 and a half. I do know that when they fill these with eggs and take them down the road, they can't put as many in a truck as if they use these. Mm -hmm. It's that close to, to the weight limit mm -hmm. where they reach the weight limit with this and they don't with this. So Plus the delivery to the egg factory. Right. This is much much heavier, and then and then you got this. The, there's people out there doing this. Mm -hmm. right. This is six, 50, 47.9 grams when you consider the label with it. I mean, that, to me, yeah. that's yeah. that's they insane when you can do it with 14.9. And this is, this would have been like 15.4, but I took a little piece out of there, and then I consistency I weighed what I had, and so um, this. This thing right here is one that's important to us. So our company makes these, and we make these. And um, is for fruit? this is for fruit. Ninety percent of the guys in Bonacci and 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 this is this is from the West Coast in, in Washington, Oregon. Ninety percent is packed in this. Ten percent get, gets packed in this because the skins are delicate, and this doesn't work. Mm. So that's that's the only reason that, that this is this this is cheaper. They got um, I don't know lots of wood fiber out out in that area, I guess. And um, so that's that's pretty much what I had in terms of oh and, and um, one of the other things that people tell me is that this polystyrene is bad for human health and. I can tell you that it's not. Um, we follow a program called GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative, and there's companies called B, like BRC, SQF, um, American Institute of Bakery, and what they do is they write a guideline that meets the requirements of the GFSI, and then we buy that standard, and then we adhere our process to that standard, and then we pay somebody to come in and audit us against that standard. I would say that's a form of self-regulation that is working. Because if we don't do that, then we will not sell our products. We won't sell our products. We have to, um, well, some people would buy them. Walmart won't buy your stuff if you don't have a certification. And Pepperidge Farms won't buy your stuff. Anyways, we, and part of the, that process is that the raw materials coming in, the FDA approvals on the raw materials come in, and us proving that we have it for, for every load. It's, it's, it's looking at the manufacturing process 
on all the things that we do, and, and we pay a professional auditor to come and do that. Does that um, certification process include uh, a life cycle on that so It does it's not. A, it's, it's, only, it's only food safety. Only food safety. Okay. Yep. I think some of our discussion, not the debate or anything, has been not so much about the nature of the contact between the packaging and the food, but what happens to the plastics after? I mean, yeah. Do they get the environment bioaccumulate? What's it, what's it mean to you? Yep. And I, 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 mean, it, 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 uh, I mean, the solid waste is a, is, a, is a big deal, and it's a huge deal. And, uh, you know, you guys have really made some, some big steps. You definitely are more recycling than, uh, than, I, than, I typic than I typically see, although I'm not a, I'm not a uh, government affairs. I don't do tons of this kind of stuff. I, I made up all this stuff on my desk uh, on Monday and last Friday. One, just one more thing, and then um, I do have one, uh, something to say to close. But um, try to wrap up. Yep. This is um, what it looks like when we recycle it. So inside our factory, if you if you can imagine, I'm not going to use that because we don't make those. You can imagine these are like in a web where there's a bunch of these in a web, and then we trim them out. In between the web is the, the trim scrap. So what we do is we chop up that web scrap, and we get and we get to this. This is we call this fluff. And then what we do is we take that stuff and we run it through and we make the, what we call reclaim. And then we take that reclaim and we stick that back into a machine and we make new material to do this. We can't take post-consumer in, um, in our, well, I shouldn't say that. In, in, in the, I believe in the, in the um, we, we, buy, we buy recycled um, reclaim to make our egg cartons. I just don't know if it's post-consumer. I'm, I'm kind of new to the egg carton business, the, um, the business that, um, you know, that the Technoplex bought for my family made the, meat, made the meat trays, and I know we're required. And so in closing, I would just say that um, you know, if, if the committee is looking at a ban on, on, on polystyrene you know, takeout, I would just look to think that the the um, items that are packed outside of Vermont, like egg cartons and fruit um, and meat, just be exempted f from that. It just adds an enormous amount of complication for you know guys trying to sell apples, and he's got this sensitive skin. And the one thing that he knows that works is he's not allowed to use anymore. And so what would happen with that? And that is all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? If you have time, or it's up to you guys. To, uh, yeah. But I think it's, I think that was great and informative because I think a lot of people try to decide the paper because they think oh, the paper's better, and once it's been coated, it's not. No, it's true. Yeah, th this is uh, very informative. Yeah, thank you for thank coming you. in with uh, visual aids. Okay. Just get to see the stuff we're talking about. And I have pictures that I took of all of this stuff that I can send to you, and if you if you want to do whatever you want to do them. Come on our website. All right. And the other thing I find interesting, especially with the egg containers, is um, you know I think a lot of people are apt to buy that heavy plastic one, which sounds like it's the absolute I think word of choice. It's like eating Jerry's or organic yeah. eggs. Yeah. Come in a plastic thing like yeah. that. Yeah, I think you're but right. It's a premium package and a premium price. Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks so much for, okay. for your help. Um, that was my pleasure. We're aware that there's some complexity in the whole yeah. yeah, so. Is this your first time here? It's not my. It's my first time to the state building. It's not my first time to Vermont. I've. Uh, it's, I've been up here as a kid doing some skiing. I did some sailing on Mallets Bay. Um, last summer, it's a it's an absolutely fabulous place, and I, I, I enjoy coming here. And I particularly appreciate being included in this meeting. I found it very uh, interesting and informative, and uh, pleased to be here. You should uh, go have lunch with Jim Harrison today. Okay. You both are here. All right. You're in the honor roll class. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks so much. So we're going to change gears a little bit and have uh, some students are visiting with us today. And um, center of champions is uh, So if you can join us at the table.
And uh, should I uh, give a little? Yeah. Sure. So, uh, more Sage and Evelyn Sage and Evelyn are two students from uh, Burn Burton Academy in Bennington County. Representative James and I had the opportunity to talk with them last week during the town meeting week, and this issue of plastics is uh, an important one to them, so they were kind enough to make the trip up today and to say a few words for us to us. So with that, thank I'll you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to your state house. So, yeah, do you want to go first? Um, I brought copies of what you're saying. Yeah, I can pass on the copies. Thank you. That's all the first time on. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Evelyn Seidner, and I am a junior at Burn Burn Academy in Manchester. And um, I am one of the 88 students involved in our school's environmental club, and along with some fifth graders at our local elementary school, we have been working towards passing um, a townwide ban on plastic bags in Manchester. And um, as important as that is to me, I think that having a statewide ban would be even more beneficial because it would cover um, more towns. And I think that this ban would be supported by a large and growing number of our youth and as well as a lot of citizens in Vermont because I think that this would really uphold one of the values that I think Vermont is, um, has, which is um, taking care of our environment, which I think is really important to a lot of people who live here. And um, plastic bags are very harmful to the environment because they are so plentiful and they are so light. So they are very easily littered and they are one of the most common pieces of trash on the ground today. And even if they are thrown away, they never fully degrade, and they become what's called um, microplastics, and those can re-enter the system and go into our soil and our waters, and animals can eat them, and it can just keep causing more and more harm. Um, they single-use plastic bags um, harm our environment when they are produced because they release toxic chemicals and they contribute to climate change and they kill our wildlife. Many animals think that plastic bags are food and they, um, they when they do eat it, uh, they fill the stomach and they give the animal a sense feeling of full and then that leads to a very slow, very painful death where the animal starves themselves without even knowing it. Uh, this is especially common in sea turtles, and I know that Vermont is not an ocean state, but it, it's still, all of our trash can lead to other places, and it's just, I think, important to think of other places besides here, and I really think that looking at the whole world and our place in it is really important. Um, so I think another really important part of Bill S-113 is that it would ban uh, plastic straws too because they also have a lot of harmful effects on animals. They're very similar to plastic bags and if an animal does um, eat it, it can get clogged in their throat or their nostrils and block their airways and cause them to suffocate. And um, as I said before, Vermont doesn't have any coast, but we do have Lake Champlain, <coughs> and those animals who live there are still uh, vulnerable to these same dangerous effects and impacts as um, uh, marine life in the ocean. And so if we did pass S-113, it would man these really harmful death traps to these innocent animals, and it would be a really important step in helping our Earth. And also, there are other places around the world and this country that have successfully banned bags. Uh, just yesterday, Maryland voted um, in the House of Delegates to, um, pa they passed um, like a, a foam bill, and their Senate has also passed a similar version of that. So now they're going to work together to finalize the bill before sending it to the governor. Um, so Vermont is not the only state trying to make these vital changes. And by acting together, we show the rest of the country how much this means to so many people. 
and this kind of bill becomes that much stronger and it has that much more momentum. Um, by passing S113, Vermont would be taking a right, the right step and in a very necessary direction if we want to save our Earth. Um, and passing it could influence other New England states, which would be really beneficial to the whole area, and it could really reduce our um, emissions and our waste. Um, and hopefully, one day, plastics will be eliminated from the country because all, almost all plastics that have ever been made still exist today. And if we keep making them and keep using them, the problem is only going to get worse. And I think we need to stop it before it's too late. Um, and every big change needs people to support it. And I think Vermont is a perfect place to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So I have some copies of what I'm going to say to Um, I just want to start off in saying that I'm Sage Waller. I was born in Bennington and I've lived in Vermont all my life. Um, banning plastic bags will happen. Single use plastic bags are evil and will eventually be banned everywhere. I want to live in a place that doesn't sit back and wait for others to act. I want to live in a state that doesn't wait until we are completely sure what's going to happen if we do what's obviously right. I want to live in a place where we live out our values, trusting that we have the support of the community to fall back onto. I want to live in a place where everyone has a voice and even emerging voters are heard and taken seriously. We know that banning plastic bags is important and we know it's inevitable, so why are we waiting? Brattleboro did it, Wilmington did it, Hawaii did it, and California did it. If something is important enough, we won't let any excuse get in our way, whether it's a potential lawsuit, unknown repercussions, or logistical compl complexities. Banning single-use plastic, plastic bags will have drawbacks, but if we all know and accept that as a community and as a state, I trust that we can come together and figure out how to make this work. Acting on values that our towns demonstrate will bring us together and create a singular voice of unity. If we don't try to resolve issues that are voiced, then we will become a state that alienates. In my town, fifth graders have done so much work, along with high schoolers, and along with a lot of other community members. If this is pushed away without any more thought, we will no longer be the trailblazing state that we have been in the past. If we are a state that listens to the youth and hears everyone's voice, Vermont will attract. Not only attract young people, but strong, powerful people that will never stop trying to make our, make our state the best place it can be. We are a new generation who are going to be picking places to live, and, we have to, and you guys have to start thinking about us differently. We're not going to wait for our values to be put into legislation here while hundreds of other cities and towns and countries have already been doing so. Those towns have the same questions we have, but what's different is that they weren't afraid of what might happen. This is cutting edge and will have drawbacks, but we can't sit back and watch others go in the right direction without even trying to do it ourselves. If we keep ignoring progressive and innovative ideas that are bound to happen in the future, no one will see themselves staying here to make a living or to raise a family. As of 2015, Vermont has the second lowest birth rate in the country. Young adults will gravitate towards that state that value environmentally friendly policies. You can trust that most of my generation will back me up on this. You've seen it on TV. We're asking for grants, planning projects and marches, teaching students how to lobby, and planning to run for office. I'm 18 years old and a registered Vermont voter. I'm going to college, maybe in Vermont, maybe in New England. But after college, I, along with the rest of the young adults my age, will be choosing a place to live. Thank you so much for having us. I just want to say that yeah, again. Yeah, really good. Yeah. yeah, very nice. So yeah. Very well yeah. done. Very helpful. Yes, yeah, of course. I have two more copies of some of these. So you've heard some of the discussion at, while you were waiting to join us at the table. Do you have any thoughts? You were talking about sorting out the complexities of polystyrene versus polyethylene coated paper versus yet another product. 
Um, yeah. So it's a little off topic for the plastic bag piece, but do you have any thoughts about yes. that? Um, I was hearing him say that we, he like compacted it down and said like this is only what we're con contributing, but so many other people are saying that like oh this is it you know, but if everyone says that it's just going to grow and like it, yeah it might look like this much. How are you going to get your eggs in the supermarket? There'll be other ways. There'll be other ways. I personally don't know, but I it's definitely very important and we the world is changing and so you it'll progressing. Add to innovation and oh, yeah. ways to think about it. Just like with everything we've been making, technology and there we don't need to rely on plastics. We didn't have plastics in well before I was born, I wasn't born, but we didn't have cell phones either. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I think we're just progressing. Cell phones have Maybe. rare earth material in them. Maybe we should give them up. I think we should start with plastic bags. But I'd be interested. <laughs> start phones and plastics. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, especially in this committee, we end up with issues of like, you know, <coughs> onion where you peel away a layer, and then you find another mm -hmm. layer, and you peel away that one, and we keep peeling, and um, but we do need to make progress. So we end up we finding the paradise by the place. Right. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for Thank coming you here. Much. Of course, welcome to the stage. We're going to be hearing from some other people as well. But um, I'll just, as a slight editorial aside, I think having younger people in the building last year most clearly made a big difference on the passage of the conference. So I appreciate, especially that you made it to all the effort to come. And I want you to know that I would say the legislature is very interested in hearing from younger Vermonters. We know we're building the laws that are going to be affecting the place. We hope you'll be staying on. And, uh, Me too. Thanks so much. You're both seniors? Just I'm a junior. junior. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Uh, well, uh, thank, thank you so back. much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Don't worry about that. Um, we're going to invite uh, Melinda uh, Petter. Is it Peter? Petter. Petter. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Melinda Petter from Williston, and uh, Chairman, Council Members. Um, first of all, before I start uh, my presentation, I want to say two things. I'm apologizing for the cell phone operator error. Thought I had it off earlier. And the other thing, in reference to one of Kathy's comments about reusable bags, I've been using my reusable grocery bags for about eight years now, at once uh, or twice a week. So that adds up to 400 to 800 uses for my fabric grocery bags, and they hold twice as much as a plastic bag, weight and value. Okay. Today I'm representing myself, plus a group known as Sustainable Williston, plus many others who have co-signed a letter which I wrote and submitted to this committee um, supporting Bill S-113. I love being a Vermonter. I'm a fan of responsible convenience, and I'm an advocate for nature. So what to do about plastics? Nobody could rationally argue that we should all together stop using plastics. It just won't happen. We simply cannot stop and go back to before because we're awash in plastics. Plastic bags, bottles, clothes, tools, medical supplies, microplastics, plastics everywhere we look. And unfortunately, as we're learning weekly, places we haven't been looking, like in fish tissue, in sea salt, in our beer, we did not know it was a problem, and then we did, and it's huge. I'm not here to talk about the whole plastics problem, just a few single-use items. Those items we use for a mere moment, and then far beyond our lifetime, they may become an item of refuse in our natural environment. Some may ask, why bother with all the hoopla of banning a few single-use plastic items or such a small part of the problem? And that may be true. However, with my um, work as an energy consultant, I know a little bit about small parts. If I could convince a business owner to start addressing small parts, change from incandescent lighting to LED lighting over here, add a little insulation over there, choose the Energy Star appliance, those small parts add up to something else, a turn away from the problem and a turn towards a solution. I never underestimate a small part. It's the catalyst. It's the thing which means that 10 years from now will be better than it would have been had we done nothing today. 
I'm passionate about this particular legislation. I have flummoxed cashiers for decades, long before it was socially acceptable to bring a bag back into a grocery store. I was reusing doubled up paper bags. You can have a new bag, ma'am. No thanks, they offered. No thanks, they have been working, the ones I have have been working just fine. I was following an example set by my mom who was doing this half a century ago. Similarly, I have been embarrassing my friends for years with my special request to hold the straw at restaurants. And some others close to me have been delighted to receive a set of fabric grocery bags which I have hand sewn just for them. This bill speaks to me and it speaks for me. I want everyone to join my efforts to reduce single-use plastic waste. About a week ago, I read up on Senate Bill S-113, and I called Senator Lyons from for some additional information. Feeling motivated to express my support, I wrote a letter to this committee and forwarded it to the Sustainable Williston Group and some friends looking for a few co-signers. Then, wow, I was unprepared for the response. People signed on. Then they forwarded the letter to the friends who signed on, and so forth. I wrote a personal note back to each one. By just the third day, I was spending hours keeping up with the supporters. In day, on day four, there were over 100 co-signers. That letter was submitted to the chair and the committee assistant on Monday night. Four days, um, just word of mouth. And I'm still receiving emails from others who want you to know that they support this bill. I'm humbled by the overwhelming positive response to the letter, yet all I did was write. The real work falls to this committee as you listen, assimilate, consider, and legislate. While you work, please know that there is a huge amount of energetic support for the stated purpose of this bill and for any additional measures you deem appropriate to make it environmentally effective and equitable. I represent the heartfelt wit and enthusiasm of all those who contacted me over the past few days. Our collective wish, be bold, be creative, and be confident in your actions to protect Vermont's land, water, and wildlife. We, everyone who signed the letter, we live here, we shop here, we work here, and we vote here, and we have your back. Our wish for Bill S-113, make it happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. So one area of concern I've heard about um, is how will, you know, what will be the impact of um, lower income Vermonters who might not uh, necessarily have um, a, a bag with them when they go to the store? Have you thought, have you heard that kind of uh, concern expressed and have you thought about solutions? I'm, I'm thinking there may be many creative solutions out there, but I'm wondering if you've worked on it. I've, I've thought about that and, and it has, the law has to be equitable. Um, I heard comments that you could charge a small amount for a paper bag, so all paper bags are not uh, in, the, in the ban here. Um, I think that eventually people will well, they can, they can use the paper bags. I have been using mine. I have some that have, they are probably at least 10 years old. If you double bag them, they work fine. Um, that we will just adjust. You know, the, we will just adjust and people will somehow learn to, you know, make, make the exception just the once to get the, the fabric bag and then we use it. Um, it, is a, it is an adjustment. Um, maybe there has to be some accommodation for that, but um, we, we can do it. Um, has the, are you, has no. the uh, Sustainable Wilson group worked on anything like, uh, for instance, in Middlebury, there was a group that was helping uh, promote the development, promote the uh, ask of the select board to then go on and write ordinance that ban single use plastic bags. And it, as part of their outreach to people, they were also making their own bags. You talked about making bags. Um, I have. Is that um, something your group has worked on? I'm just wondering if there are a lot of people out there who might actually pitch in, for instance, and help solve the problem by uh, sewing. We haven't addressed that. And um, we did have a discussion, a brief discussion, about whether we should advocate for going to the select board to ask if we should start um, look, you know, look at banning bags just in Williston. But we thought this would be more effective to just more comprehensive to deal with at a statewide level. Um, any questions for Ms. Pat? Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you so much for your time. So, committee, uh, let's take a break till 10.15. We'll pick back up. We're right. almost on our list. Right. And um, 
So thank you, everyone. We'll resume at 10.15. Jeez. Why? Wow. We got a bell around We're going to end conversations around the room and invite to the table Mr. Hey, Brian, Lansky. would you take care of your extra chair now? Come on. So, uh, uh, yeah, you? Okay. I take this draw nine. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Why do I go to waste? So, you've been here this morning. You've heard of the conversation. Please uh, you know, introduce yourself sure. to the committee and uh, fill us in on what you're thinking about. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Phil Rosensky. I'm here on behalf of the American Progressive Bag Alliance. The trade association uh, represents the manufacturers and recyclers of plastic bags. I'm one of the members. Uh, the executive director couldn't be here. He had a death in the family, so I'm one of the members I'm filling in for him. Uh, the company I do work for is called Novalex. I'm the senior director of sustainability. Uh, we are a company that manufactures plastic and paper bags. We are a recycler of plastic bags. We have two facilities where we recycle. And we manufacture other uh, types of packaging as well. Um, I heard a lot of interesting and, and things that maybe I can help with in my role as a sustainability director, give you some more insights on what it means um, up, up the uh, value chain life cycle things. One of the things we do as a company is our company is focused on circular economy. I heard that this morning. We look at products where we want options. The reason we're in both paper and plastic is we want the option for different packaging to do what's right not be stuck with one solution. So we have a look at things. How can we make things more sustainable and support a circular economy? Um, there's a few things that when I heard this morning, I maybe wanted to help clarify some things. I've uh, been asked to step in and testify here and there over the last 12 years while I've been doing this job. Um, one of the common things I hear is the term plastic bags. And as I hear a lot of the debate, um, and it talks about litter and the environment, I do want to highlight that that's one that makes me cringe as a researcher. Um, because we're not talking about plastic bags. Here. We're talking about plastic retail bags, not plastic bags. And there's a significant difference because plastic retail bags are a very small portion. The photos that you have there of the MRF facilities, uh, we do work with MRFs to help educate the public to take plastic retail bags and other polyethylene films out. Uh, there's been several studies. Most of the film that you see wrapped around there isn't plastic retail bags. It's other plastic bags and film. And that what they found out were these, it's important to know this because where they have implemented policies like that, and I'll talk about it in a minute, a lot of the things, the goals that are, are sought don't occur because we're misunderstanding the data and we're misunderstanding what's going on. And most of it goes back to the fact that <coughs> litter studies aren't granular enough and they talk about plastic bags. And so they think we're going to make such an impact and it's a small portion of it. So um, when I've been working with this over the last, uh, so, well, just so I understand, yep. so are you suggesting we should expand the definition? Uh, I think you'd be careful when you're looking at data sets. Are you looking at data that's relevant to plastic bags or plastic retail bags? Um, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second, why that's important. So over this last 10 years that I've worked on this on and off, and uh, again, we work with people to develop solutions because we do recycle it. We do want the material back. We've learned a lot of things, and really, there's really three things that I think we kind of <coughs> have realized with plastic bag regulation, or plastic retail bag regulation. The first one is, I think nobody can argue it, and we would agree with the basic <coughs> fact that drives the, this type of policy, and that's you can ban anything or tax it, and it goes away, or people use less of it. Um, and that's what becomes attractive about these policies, is the idea of this ready solution. Um, the fact of it is um, every place that's called it a success deems it a success because they implemented a ban, they went away, they put a tax, they use less of it. But that leads to the second point. This discussion, and you're hearing about it, it's not about plastic retail bags. What we're really talking about is litter, landfill, marine debris, how are we managing plastics. And when you look at this, we're always talking about the goals and this deemed a success, but very few, very few locations have gone back, and there have been some, and have looked at this, and what they find out is the goals aren't achieved. There's a lot of unintended consequences, or because of lack of terminology, the marks were missed. Uh, for example, in Austin, they had a bag ban, and what they found out was uh, after they banned plastic bags, about three years later, they did a study of the waste stream, and they found out the tonnage of reusable bags, by the way, about 99.9% .9 of them are made of plastic, 
whether it's made to look like cloth or film. Um, the tonnage of reusable bags actually exceeded what they had of plastic retail bags. What's found out is the people that use reusable bags 100 times, 200 times, and they do, were already doing it beforehand. And this when we mandated it, people used them a lot less. And so what happens is where do those go at end of life? And it wasn't, wasn't planned for. San Francisco. Francisco quick clarify. So when people mandated using re reusable, reusable bags, bags, people use them less. Yeah, the do frequency. Do those numbers? Absolutely, yeah. we do. Yeah. Share those yeah, a, a non-woven polypropylene, but which is still a, a drop there. Does that mean that I'd like to see it compared to sure. what if, if plastic bags were not banned? Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. a, you don't have that with you. Uh, I don't have it with me, but okay. we will get that to you. Um, it's about 16 uses is what the average is. There was a uh, consumer survey. If you poll people and ask them how much there's that feel good moment, they'll say, yeah, I use it 100 times. But when they do consumer surveys, they find out that on sales, it's about 16 uses on average. But if plastic moment. bags were banned and they were being forced to use this, what were they doing? Just buying more. They were buying more of them. Buying more this, of the reusable. Yeah, the dollar bags that go out of the store, for the, they buy them like crazy. Oh, the dollar, the reusable bags. Though. Yep. And yeah, okay. they, don't, they don't get used as much. When people act okay. accumulating, they forget them, they buy more. And I then see. they end up in the waste stream. Um, it's an unintended consequence. And not like 300 million that were used last year, plastic bags in Vermont. No, but, not. but the tonnage is exceedingly higher. So um, cause they do get a 16 uses out of it, so the less, less bags, but more plastic is what yeah, I heard. I'd love to see that research. Yeah. The second one uh, was San Francisco. Uh, there's a group called the Bay Area Structure <laughs> Management Agency. And as cities, uh, basically it's a unifying district to help them address issues for the San Francisco Bay. And they had studied, um, they were under orders from the EPA to reduce the amount of litter going through storm drains into the bay. And so as some cities were implementing bans on various products, <coughs> which was plastic retail bags, they studied a before and after. And they found out, yep, if you ban plastic bags, they didn't show up. But the daily tonnage of uh, litter going through storm drains remained the same because what they found is replacement products still occurred. Whether um, and I don't I don't work with expanded polystyrene, but that study covered that as well. But other products that replaced it, other things went in there as well. And so it, what we're seeing is this common story that our intent all I mean, and that's what everybody here is talking about is to see ways how can we reduce litter, land landfill, marine debris, manage plastics better. And we're focusing on products rather than a broader one. But all the studies are showing very little gains in that area. The third thing is is the just a quick question about Austin, Texas. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing you surveyed a lot of uh, programs <coughs> across the country. Mm -hmm. Is Austin, Texas's data representative? Yes, it is. Um, there was a study in Oregon uh, about uh, MRFs, uh, facilities or, or curbside and stream recycling that looked at the issue here, you know, and they did a composition study and found out that plastic retail bags were such a small portion, there wasn't a lot to be made. One of the largest uh, data challenges we're facing is for years, Ocean Conservancy, uh, they do the annual international coastal cleanup. And part of the reason uh, plastic retail bags became uh, such a hot button 10 years ago is uh, plastic bags were 10% of what they were finding on the beach. Uh, in 2013, that number dropped down to about 1% not because there was a reduction in bags, it was the first year they had plastic retail as a separate category. And so it showed that to make a difference on bags and film, we've got to look at this as a broader category because we're leaving it behind. So first we know, you know, we agree bans and taxes work, but second is we're finding out we're missing the problem with these types of policies because we've gotten too granular <coughs> rather than system. I hear some discussion and that's very heartening today here, just talks about broader things that could be done. Um, the third thing we see is, you know, they come with, you know, that with consequences. Uh, I said I work for a company that manufactures both plastic and paper, and we do recycle plastic bags. We buy the, the grocery store material and process it. A plastic bag costs about a penny, penny and a half. A uh, plain paper bag costs around seven to eight cents without handles. You can go over ten cents with the handles. The cost to a grocery store can quickly be sixteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month additional cost when uh, most people don't realize grocery stores make uh, low margins, about 2%, you're, you're quickly talking needs to increase sales by nearly a million dollars a month to cover these types of options at 2% margin. So it has impacts uh, on a city by city level. Uh, people, because they do a lot of shopping in their cars when there's political boundaries, um, 
one of the options is sometimes people cross boundaries. Obviously, if you get in your car, you go in your mile, go a mile to the right. Sometimes you go a mile to the left and you're in a different district. That's another thing. Retailers saw a lot of unintended consequences. We are working, uh, as the company that I work for, I said we're focused on uh, circular economy and is the uh, plastic retail bag industry. Uh, our retail bags, we're very interested in recycling programs. 30% of our manufacturing is made from recycled content. We do buy what comes back from the grocery stores. Our largest challenge to increasing recycling, uh, there was three recent life cycle assessments done. One was uh, done in Denmark, that was done about a year and three or four months ago. One in Quebec that was published about a year ago, and Clemson did one about four years ago. Uh, the Quebec one found that 79% of bags were reused as can liners. That's our biggest obstacle to recycling. It's not that people don't care. There's not much remaining. So, you know, as, as you look at this, we would encourage everybody to, to also look, I think you mentioned earlier, peeling back the layers of the onion. Uh, there's a lot of things that seem like quick and easy solutions. They do uh, often miss the mark because we're really talking about the broader topics, our environment, managing plastics and figuring that out, but also to come with costs and unintended consequences, which we hope aren't overlooked as well. Uh, it is a very complex onion, to say the least. On the unintended consequences piece, I mean, one of the concerns people raise is uh, plastics don't, uh, like other natural materials, they mm -hmm. don't decompose to a level where they re-enter the food chain in a, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. part of a new tree, a new plant, et cetera, yeah. and you can bioaccumulate as microplastics. Mm -hmm. So uh, over time, it's we're creating, you know, in essence, permanent just pollution or a permanent challenge out there. Mm -hmm. if, have you looked at the impact of those plastics on uh, human and animal health, plant health, et cetera? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we understand that. That's why, you know, in the, in the near the near term approach we have is we are working, you know, with the <coughs> retailers, we work with them to get the recycling. We don't want that to happen. It is a broader issue than any of the, any of the items you're talking about today. Um, when you talk microplastics, you're going way beyond packaging because the vast majority of it isn't packaging related that you're talking about today. Again, one of these, is it really solving that problem and how are we approaching that from a larger <coughs> approach? There was an initiative that was launched uh, last month. The plastics industry is uh, trying to find ways to get engaged more with that. Um, again, we, we do recycling and part of what we do to help with that is use recycled content. We're trying to create more demand to pull that out of the system and back into products. Okay. Um, any questions for Mr. Rosensky? If you could send along the um, some yes. of the studies or links that you were talking about, that'd be great. Yep. As you know, we're also aiming towards creating a working group, and that would seem like a sort of place that would naturally evaluate those kinds of studies. And that and that's one thing I think that would be important, Senator Bray, is to make sure that we have some folks that know the industry on the working group but because that I mean that show and tell that we just had kind of flipped what I would naturally think in my head uh, upside down uh, so I, I just think that's something that's not yet included and we've got to need to make sure that perspective is part of the working group yeah yeah, yeah I mean, and, uh, we're <coughs> after fearful balanced uh, learning on the whole topic, uh, not be judging the outcome. So yeah, we would like to help as much as possible. But again, these are studies done by cities, municipalities. We'd rather send you their information than hear from us. Obviously, yep. if people don't prefer to hear it from us, we, we wish they would listen as well. But we find it's better to get you the studies done by other uh, government agencies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, may I uh, submit a uh, testimony? We have two fifth graders over here, uh, also from Manchester. Is it okay if we sit, rather than just submit their testimony? They did some work sure, on this also. Sure, we have a little wiggle room in the schedule, and so if you want to talk to the committee, uh, we'll be back. God would be intimidated by Bennington County today. I'm not quite yet, I think, but, but yeah, just in case we have time, we might. Thank you. Um, so let's pause just for a moment, we'll, uh, and we have council scheduled. If we could let council in the door, <laughs> that would Great. be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This Mike O'Grady out there, he probably ran away. He probably has got 12 <laughs> other things to do. Yeah. Crack window. Climb out. Yeah. <laughs>
Mr. Ross and help me, Allison Ross. The ski is on the boat. Mr. Christman. A uh, Christman, sorry, yeah. Oh. So that chair in the corner is kind of Bill 113. My name is Keith Christman. I'm managing director of the Plastic Food Service Packaging Group at the American Chemistry Council. We represent manufacturers of uh, plastic food service, including uh, polyethylene foam food service. Although we support reducing litter and marine debris and waste, we oppose S-113 because it won't accomplish those goals. We're committed to ending plastic waste in the environment. In fact, our industry uh, recently helped found a new organization called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. This new 501c3 group launched in January. It is the $1.5 billion uh, fund. It will help put in place critically needed waste management in uh, rapidly developing countries, particularly in Asia. Uh, the focus of the work will be in five key countries in Asia that account for 60% of plastic waste going in the ocean. So by contrast, you all should know that the United States as a whole accounts for less than one half of 1%. Uh, so it, it, the focus is on where it needs to be on rapidly developing countries in Asia that lack basic waste management. Many of the people in these countries, 50% uh, of the people in the country, don't even have curbside collection or any collection of their waste. So that waste is getting out into the rivers, into the oceans, and uh, becoming a big problem from a brain debris perspective, as I'm sure you all have seen. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? You just said, I, I didn't catch the full uh, statistic you were sharing. So one half of 1% of all marine waste originates in the U.S.? Is, was that what you were saying? Yes, that's the case. Okay. We, we, there are five countries in Asia, uh, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, and Sri Lanka, that uh, the study from Science Magazine in 2015 estimated account for 60% of the waste. Uh, the United States accounts them for less than one half of 1%, according to the same study. Okay. So the focus of the Alliance Send Plastic Waste that I mentioned, the $1.5 billion fund that plastic manufacturers and chemistry companies and the entire value chain are involved in investing in uh, the focus of that fund, uh, $1.5 billion, is going to be to invest in critically needed waste management in those large source countries. Uh, that said, here at home, we do have work to do as well. Uh, we established, the American Chemistry Council has established uh, circular economy goals, and those are that um, by 2040, um, we'll recycle, and recover, or reuse all plastic packaging, and by 2030, all plastic packaging will be recyclable or recoverable, and that's for the entire United States. So we have work to do to accomplish those goals, and we'll be very active in, in reaching them and hope to partner with Vermont and other states in reaching those goals. Um, so, you know, American plastic makers are committed to ending plastic waste in the environment. We think that's very important. Unfortunately, this bill will not accomplish that goal. This bill instead will cause switch to, switch to alternative products we will actually have greater environmental impact, including greater greenhouse gas emissions and energy use. In the case of polystyrene foam, for example, the energy increase energy use increases by about fifty percent, and it increases greenhouse gas emissions. Particularly, um, you know, in this case, looking at it switches to paper, but that's true for many alternative <coughs> other alternative materials as well. Um, so should, Vermont should conduct a life cycle assessment if it's going to be considering this kind of approach switching to alternatives to make sure that you don't um, encourage people to use things that are actually worse for the environment or increase greenhouse gas emissions, for example. Um, it's also true that generally the, the um, alternatives are not recyclable or compostable in many cases. Um, and often in the case of composting, food service is not generally collected for, for composting. Um, so alternatives also, it should be known, won't reduce litter. Um, studies that have been done before and after bans on polystyrene foam, particularly in San Francisco, show that while polystyrene litter goes down, the alternative product, like cold paper coffee cups, increases by more than the amount that the um, polystyrene foam litter goes down. Often people misperceive these alternatives as biodegradable, and they're therefore more likely to litter them. For this reason, the California Water Board rejected the uh, use of bans 
in accomplishing and implementing uh, the trash regulations through the, throughout the state of California. They decided bans were not the right approach to implement throughout the state of California for implementing the stormwater trash regulations. Um, so alternatives for foam fuel also double the cost for, for restaurants and for, for consumers. So what we would be doing by implementing this is actually uh, charging customers more money for products that uh, actually increase the environmental impact. So that's clearly not the right approach. When it comes to straws, um, we think a better approach would be to adopt California's approach of straw upon request. Um, California adopted this approach because it reduces unnecessary use of straws. It makes us all think about it. Do we need a straw in every situation? You know, if we're just a sit-down restaurant, uh, why do we need a straw? Um, that's, that's the case of that kind of legislation where you ask people to think about it. If you ask for a straw, they can have one. But this one isn't automatically provided. Um, one of the benefits of this kind of legislation is it allows for families with small children or uh, for people who are going to be driving to have a straw when they need one. Um, it also causes people to think about whether they need one. A ban won't accomplish that behavior change. Uh, a ban will just cause an immediate switch to alternatives. Um, and in the case of alternatives for, for straws, um, I've weighed some of the alternatives and compared them to plastic straws, and they tend to weigh about three times as much. Uh, so they're going to have a higher impact on the environment, and they're also um, they're also uh, this policy, that kind of policy doesn't cause people to change how they use them. So they're just as likely to uh, become trash or litter. With respect to, to bags, um, the other one thing the committee should also consider is. Um, recycling of other polyethylene film product wraps. Um, when, when bags are banned, at times we've seen the grocery stores stop collecting other um, polyethylene film at the front of the grocery store, things like uh, uh, bread bags or dry cleaning bags or wraps or wrap pieces of soda. Those things can be recycled at the front of the grocery store along with their plastic bags and be made into new products like uh, additional film or um, track decking boards or products like that, composite decking boards that last for decades. Um, so we're concerned about uh, the fans on that could have the adverse impact of reducing collections uh, at grocery stores of other film plastics and also increased contamination in material recovery facilities that people then don't know what to do with their, their other product wraps. Uh, so in summary, uh, bans are not the right approach. We think they will increase greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, and weight. Uh, therefore, we oppose this legislation. Um, do you all have any questions? Um, anyone on the committee have a question? Okay. No questions. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Thank you again. Have a good day. So, um, on the We'll uh, pause for a moment since we have council with us. Um, originally, when we scheduled, we asked you to come in. It was because uh, we were, I was hoping that we might be at a place of uh, doing some adjustments to language, editing as a committee with you and uh, making some edit requests for tomorrow. Um, the things that I'm hearing, so I don't think we're quite ready to pass those along, but just to give you a heads up, they wanted to pause and talk as a committee. I think the thing that we, my sense of where we're heading is that the, uh, the area that we want to do the most work on is uh, rewriting the section on what that working group will do, who's on it, um, having a group, uh, sort of an ordinary legislatively head, a headed committee so that we have a, one or more members of the House and Senate on it, uh, to build out the membership of the panel so we make sure we hear from all the parties that we think we ought to get information from and that the um, shift is from maybe a narrow focus on a particular product to saying can we look at packaging more broadly and uh, extended uh, producer responsibility programs and how they might work with uh, packaging. So. I don't, if you have language around, I don't know how we even define packaging legally yet, so maybe if 
you can start either thinking about or drafting along those lines, and then I'd like to uh, catch up with you later today and bring, once we've done, ferry you over some more details <coughs> so that we can get the draft to look at tomorrow. Is that <coughs> feasible? Sure, if you let me go now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I think. We right. Thank you very much. Okay. Just okay. on the fly, kind of here. All right. So we. Thank you. Um, so we've had other people come into the room and wanted to uh, invite other people to speak to the committee while we're doing this grand tour. Um, so they're they're a pair of students. Would you like to come in? Join us at the end of the table like the other students were here just a little while ago. <coughs> Talk to us for a minute. Just say minutes per minute. <coughs> Come on up. <coughs> well, a big deal. This yeah. is like having great. a conversation with your neighbors who happen to be serving in the legislature. Right. Awesome. So, so just tell you. us. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say if you can introduce yourself, tell us where you came yeah. up <coughs> from and over from and what. And then share what you're thinking about with the committee. How you wanted to talk to us today? Um, my name is Malayla Green, and I'm from Manchester. So you're from Manchester, okay? Yes. I'm Peyton Chalvin. I also I'm also from Manchester. Okay. I used to run chainsaw quite a bit, and I'm a little hard of hearing. If you could speak up, that'll help you understand. Right up, even though that won't amplify. Okay. Pretend it will. Um, so just tell us why you did what you did and what that piece of paper is in front of you. Um, <coughs> this is a letter that everyone in the fifth grade at, at MEMS, our school, has written. Like, we split into groups and we all had a part. Like, some people worked on what had happened. Like, it was all on what had happened since the last time we had been to our select board in Manchester. And we were just basically writing about like, like we have par five, I think there's five paragraphs and each one has its own topic of what we had done. And like we did a lot to try and pass the ban and we keep urging the select board but they kind of don't agree with us. Some people don't, some of them do. So we're just trying to like keep urging them until they officially pass the ban in our town. Was there a vote yeah. in Manchester? And I know your teacher's here also. Yes. <laughs> so was there, what, what was the vote about in Manchester? So um, we went to the town meeting and uh, to Miss Nicholson, our teacher, and uh, one other person in our grade read this letter to like the town, in the town meeting, and then they had a vote after to see who would want to urge the select board and who wouldn't and through most of the people said yes to urging the select board to yeah. do what to to um, um, keep moving forward with the ban and urging them like the more pressure we put on them and the more we keep urging them the more they're going to feel that we should pass this ban do you know what the, the result of the vote was what the, how it, how that played out we want, I, I, we were both busy that day and couldn't make it, but Miss Nicholson, our teacher, had recorded it, and, um, <coughs> er, she didn't record it, like, Gina was there, the local TV, and they were recording it, and, um, if you listen, you can hear mostly yays. But there was a couple. But there were a couple people who said nay and didn't agree with what we had said. So is the so you didn't have it. They didn't vote it and count ballots. It was a voice vote on the yeah. town meeting. Okay. And so uh, I guess was the conclusion in the end that the select board, the town is instructing the select board to go ahead and look at creating an ordinance. Is that that's yes? The, yeah. Sure. Can you guys speak a little bit about why you want them single-use plastic bags? <coughs> you, you did, they did a lot of research. So, after all the research we had done, and like we've learned about all the like harm they have done to our world, like I've seen things like in here somewhere it said like if we don't ban these now, 
plastic bags will still be around by the time our great great grandkids die. Like when that, by the time that happens, the plastic will still be in the ocean. It'll still be all over our land. And, but if we don't do anything, but if we do, we can stop that. And the animals won't be getting hurt, we won't be getting hurt, and the environment will be better. Yeah. And then it also says in here that we use uh, five trillion plastics bags worldwide each year in a year so we just want to like we're trying to ban them because we know that they're hurting our environment and that if we don't we can't they will be around till like our grandchildren are like 40 or i think it's yeah. like 40 or something like that so, so you've heard us talking with the different people about how, what would we do instead of just using the, the single-use plastic bags what were you what was what have you thought about and what were you recommending um, we had like thought of like working with one of our teachers at our school who like she's a really good like sewer and stuff and like sewing and hand making some of our own um, reusable bags or like we tell like the stores that like we should get they should have um, reusable bags if they don't already for people to use but that way everyone can have a reusable bag to use you just reuse it over and over again. And eventually we won't need plastic bags anymore. And we could do paper bags too, but reusable bags would be more um, uh, effective than the paper bags, because paper bags are, would still, they're still kind of putting bad things in our earth in some ways. Well, um, thank you very much. I don't thank know if you were in the room. With the other, were you in the room with the other students? Were yeah. No. Okay. So the thing I said to them that I want to make sure that you hear is that uh, it, we really appreciate you making the trip up and coming to talk to us. Um, you may not be old enough to vote, but we also know we work for you. you know, every legislator works for everyone in Vermont. And so it's really great to have you making that trip and uh, <coughs> appreciate that your class is thinking about you know, how to be good citizens in the state. You know. So thanks for doing it. Senator, Senator I'd Rogers. like if we give their class a couple <coughs> things to think about. Okay. Do you guys have cell phones yet? <laughs> what are they made of? Metal, I don't know. Plastic. Every cell phone has rare earth minerals in it. Rare earth minerals in this cell phone, supposedly they have to dig up over 500 pounds of the earth in the mine that they get those from to get the few little specks of rare earth minerals that are in here. So I think it'd be a great thing for you guys to look into in your class at, the, at what is happening in places in the world where they're mining the things to build these because they are, they are um, just terrible uh, to the earth where they're mining them. Maybe there can be substitutes for those things, possibly. But I think that's a great thing to look into. Yeah. Well, one thing we always find when we, in this community, I'd say, is whenever we look at one little piece of an issue, we find that there's a lot of other connections around it. And the other thing that makes me wonder is if plastic bags last a thousand years or all those generations, does that mean all the people walking around picking up dog poop in plastic bags are preserving it for a thousand years? I don't think so. That would have been a good question. For a great question. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, what kind of bags do we use at our school for our composting? Oh, we use compostable bags. Compostable yeah. bags. Could also be used to pick up dog food. Yeah, so yeah, but, like, and there's also a question about some of the uh, compostable bags actually don't totally break down and they lead to microplastics in the soils. So you have to be real careful about which kind of compostable bags you pick as well. Yeah, we so, definitely need good technology. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I still want to answer the dog food question. <laughs> So I, uh, during break, I heard from uh, one or two more people that would like to uh, speak to the committee while we're on the tour, on the big tour today. 
would you like to join us? Well, you can just uh, introduce yourself to the record and say who you're representing and what uh, concern you want to bring forward. Thanks. Thanks for the time. Matt McMahon with MMR, um, and we're working with the Theater Owners of New England. It's an association of movie theaters across New England, also in Vermont. Uh, and would like to speak specifically to um, the portion of the bill pertaining to straws. Um, the issue that we see here is that while um, clearly um, you know, restaurants make use of straws in certain ways. Movie theaters are a little different um, in that they, um, they first of all, um, you know, you don't get your drink brought to you in a well-lighted area. Um, and even in restaurants where you kind of pick your stuff up at the counter and bring it to your table, um, it's a different situation in a movie theater where it's dark. Uh, you have, you know, a flight of stairs usually to get up, um, you know, to your seat. Um, and... That in itself poses an issue for um, theater owners because it can lead to, um, and first of all, messes, but um, on a concrete floor, a slip and a fall um, in the dark. Um, if, you know, straws aren't available, you can provide a lid, but when you have a large container with ice, you take the lid off and spill it everywhere. It's especially um, for, um, you know, for children. That could be um, an Cold. issue. Yeah, cold burns, yeah, exactly. Um, so that could be an issue as as well. Um, so I know that there are, uh, there's an allowance for folks with disabilities to request a straw. Um, and we would hope that um, in the situation of a movie theater um, where you're not having your drink brought to you, um, that there would be the ability to um, have a consumer ask for a straw. Um, theater runners have considered using paper straws. The issue with paper straws or, you know, rice straws, alternative straws, people that have used them, is they're great for 30 to 45 minutes. They work as intended. But if you're sitting, you know, in a two and a half hour movie, um, you'll have a hard time using it at the end of the movie because they tend to soften up, close up. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of what they have. Um, to say so for convenience, sure. homeless movie buyers, if they can't get the straw, just probably buy a 20 ounce plastic bottle of soda or water. They could. Um, one of the more expensive than well drinks, so right. they one, that the well drinks sure. go away because there's no proper way to consume them. Well, you know, you can go like this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, seriously. Have you ever gone to the movie with a... But no, I just want to bring some like, reality to like, some of this right. conversation. With a, with a, with a paper, if, you're using a, but if you're using a paper <clears throat> cup, Brian, the same right. thing happens to the great paper cup as happens to the paper straw. At the end of a two-hour movie, your paper cup is starting to be as loose as a noodle, and you're having kids pick them up with, with no cover. So, but this bill yeah, says it's our, This bill, as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, is completely by request. Right. So, I mean, it's not going to... So, it's actually, it's, it's draft for everyone, it's, it's not. Well, by the medical Right, so you, the bill speaks to somebody requesting a straw if they have a disability. Yeah. Um, I think we were talking about the possibility of changing that for yeah. everyone. Which, absolutely, right. which right. we would support. Right. Right. So I just wanted so to... So the movie right. theater people would be okay. That would, that that would be an improvement, yes. Okay. Theater owners, yep. Um, and to your point on 20-ounce drinks, um, they don't stay cold as long. And there's also a storage issue. Um, if everybody came in to the movie theater asking for a cold 20 ounce drink, um, it would be a challenge to be able to serve those. Uh, just when you're at the movie theater looking behind the counter, usually there's a small uh, cooler. It's not a lot of space behind the counter. And it's cheap as dirt to mix up soda. It's what? It's very cheap to mix that soda oh, and yeah. pour it It's usually the largest margin product in the rest yeah, of Yeah, it's huge. Um, any other questions for Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We need to make your covers that have a sippy top, like you can sippy cup. Those are probably bad. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> so it's the cover of the straw goes to the permanent sippy cup. <laughs> there was a bring your own sippy cup. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, anyone else? In the, so uh, again, we, because drafting is being done for us while we're here, we can't. We have the luxury of having more time 
than originally thought. Well, I'd love to, if it makes sense, just yeah. touch it, touch base with everybody on the committee to see where people are on this, so that, you know, because yeah. I think some people are concerned. <clears throat> yeah. So maybe we do a little straw poll or however. Maybe <laughs> straw or paper. Uh, I'll, I'll speak for me. I'm, I'm fine with the bags and straws. I have no concerns about the policy. <laughs> Personally, I just think we may be looking penny wise, pound foolish on, on the whole life cycle. But even the working group you're against? Yeah, I'm okay. okay. I'm moving forward. Working group can look I'm okay. You like the working group. Right, that's, that's, that's right. Anything right. and everything. Yeah, right. right. But I wouldn't ban it at this point. Right. No, me neither. Okay. Okay. But are you okay with bags and straws? With bags? Bags, yeah. Just banning them out right yeah. now? Oh, I have to think about that. Is that a yes? I just think about it. I'll have to think about that. I'm not ready to quit yet. I haven't gotten anything out of Brian ever, so I mean, this might be my chance. This is a big <laughs> moment. And you could get an answer to that special question you had. Um, <laughs> I'm good. He's gonna work on. I'm good uh, uh, with bags and straws. I like the I, I like the working group. You know, it is complex. All the other additional things. How could we possibly, you know, start to do this? And I think putting that group together. I think Senator Rogers right. Get pe all sorts of people on there to have that conversation. Senator McDonald. I, I was impressed with the gentleman that came in with all the products. And this is like global warming. We can put together working groups and set deadlines and then pat ourselves on the back. And it's like global warming. We haven't acted on our own deadlines. So uh, whatever step we take should be a real one. So, so on the so you would forego the work if we just say ban all? Sounds no, like, I, you know, yeah, I, I was impressed when it came to some of the energy you used right, and yeah, the, yeah. and that that this we're taking up more landfill space or less landfill space and use more, more, uh, you know, resources to make something. That was, uh, I, I was wrong about it, if you would. No, it's yeah. I think we all were. Yeah. And that kind of person, to Senator Rogers' point, should be on this. Yeah, kind of, like, yeah. Have and this make kind sure of conversation. They're, they're and it's making, not doing one thing. And make and, sure they're making decisions <clears throat> based on science and reality, right. not on perception. Right. But those, this, these, these uncertainties shouldn't be an impediment to setting, a, setting out to make some real changes. Okay. And I would say, to be honest, I, I don't think the United States does a great job with packaging compared to Europe and other countries, and I think there are possibilities that could come out of this uh, new innovative sort of ways to package. <clears throat> so are we, yeah. I, you know, we keep talking about public-private partnerships and, and, you know, the private organizations get to produce all this stuff the way they want to, and then the public is supposed to go around and pay to clean it up. And that's, that's, that needs to change. Uh, and again, the, the gentleman that, that, was, that, had, that went through with the primer with the different weights and volumes and might be a, a <coughs> more a thoughtful way to, to move ahead. So, okay. so uh, yeah, I hear that and appreciate it. You know, the notion of uh, one challenge is when we uh, privatize profits and uh, socialize uh, profits. Yeah. So, uh, and that to me seems like the whole notion of getting ahead of it, looking at packaging in a more <coughs> proactive way. Mm -hmm. So, we're, in terms of the packaging, and so the drafting that request to Michael will be about uh, beefing up the working group, you know, expanding the. Um, Membership. So we talked about coming from the plastics industry. Uh, Rogers, you were saying that. I like Senator Rogers to be on from the Senate. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I think it would be good to, for somebody on this committee to somebody from the House from the Senate. I'm not on summer studies and working groups. Okay, so we won't put you on it if you vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to report it. Well, so here I have. Look at the bill itself and the language around who's on the working group right now is. Uh, I've that always crazy about legislators being out, but. Right. You know, but that's just me. I get too married to the, the group. Committee. 
leave the other group and do their thing. But. Although I think the advantage is when we have someone at the table, then the information comes back into the committee, especially if it's a working group from year one to year two and a single biennial. But you know, the, so we have uh, from League of Cities and Towns, uh, someone from the plastics industry, my retail and grocers association, a municipality that implemented a bag ban, uh, a solid waste hauler. Seems like from what we've heard, there should be someone who's operating uh, MRF, um, who we're leaving out. You got somebody. Well, people like this. Somebody that knows the industry. The industry. Somebody from the industry. Right. So that's yeah. I mean, an environmentalist. Environmentalist. <coughs> For science, yeah. One environmentalist. <laughs> he likes to pretend, but he really actually is a shade environmentalist. I'll tell you right now. Lauren and I are beyond. <laughs> Can we specify names? <laughs> are you getting all this? <laughs> Um, well, and then of course, in terms of uh, we need uh, DEC's uh, leadership on this stuff, uh, in terms of running the current system and knowing where the opportunities are. Solid waste districts. And the solid waste districts. Or, yeah. One or two. Or Maybe uh, from a large district that is someone who's operating a smaller system, preferably in the Northeast Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other suggestions for who ought to be at the table? You know, the other thing too is, well, so we'll see a draft. We can edit the next draft if people think about it. So I'd ask people to think about who's present or not present. The other thing is any panel can always be, will be inviting in plenty of witnesses. So you don't need to be on the panel yeah. in order to affect the proceedings. So I'll uh, meet up with uh, Mr. O'Grady this afternoon, make those requests. Uh, back on the straw language, I think we heard, heard that by request was um, worked better for, you know, I think that's going to cut down dramatically. The number of requests or the impact of including Everyone. No, I think a lot of people just won't request them. Okay. Well, we can evaluate. <clears throat> I think part of the, the point of sensitivity I heard was that if, you're, if it's for medical reasons that people would need them, then it puts that person Yeah, what are they going to do? Show a doctor's note? I mean, right, right. And then so retailers don't want to be responsible for evaluating whether or not you're presenting right. a legitimate reason for requesting such a straw. So I think we leave that qualifications part out, um, we respond to both sides of the equation. Okay. Sir McDonald. So I, I think some of the, okay, you, you're putting a group together, but the areas that ought to be, I just, I also want to acknowledge the Champlain District for having mm -hmm. helped us understand things that I didn't know a couple hours ago. That, um, we, they ought to be looking at landfill reduction by volume, and they ought to be looking at the energy that's used to manufacture the product, and they ought to be looking at the releases to the atmosphere of the different choices. And uh, the last one is, uh, is most likely to be blowing in the wind. But um, just the, the litter issue, um, and, and some of the conceptions that we you know, had coming in here were uh, a little bit reorganized, not diminished, but reorganized. Um, and I've been thinking the last few weeks, um, as since this first came up, that, that all the tasks performed by plastic were performed by something else 50, 60 years ago. But the amount of weight and cumbersomeness, um, glass, um, <coughs> it's enormous. Right. And, you know, you go from a world of three billion people up to eight, um, you start taking shortcuts. There's your biggest problem right there. Too many uh, people. So, uh, 
I haven't seen any plastic caskets yet. So. <laughs> or maybe they just haven't reached. You don't notice until like, they close it. Aren't they? That's the <laughs> so anyway, um, okay. those, but that's, those would be the questions. Okay. I'm what we're to... talking about, right, the charge to the committee would be written. So we're talking about ex exploring extended producer responsibility and packaging broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so you were, just to make sure you're not these things when you said landfill impacts, right? Um, energy use is in life cycle analysis, energy use, um, propensity to create litter. Anything else that I miss one? I think I did. Most likely to be blown in the wind. Okay. Right. Litter. Anything else that people in the committee can think of that we're missing in terms of what we should be asking the working group to look into? Can I make a Yes, if you can just stay your name for the record. Sure, I'm Lynn Levins. Um, I'm representing myself, but I do teach a pollution class at the University of Vermont. Um, and I just wanted to clarify the point about the egg cartons in the water. So the one was actually breaking down, the fiber, the cardboard one was breaking down versus the other one would be persistent in the environment. So there, from the environmental perspective, the cardboard one would be friendlier, would go back to organic matter and become a plant, whereas the, the um, other would not. And I just wanted to also make the point that there was a study done, and as of 2015, of all the plastics ever produced, only 9% has been recycled. So we're continuing to add to this burden on uh, our plastic burden on the planet. And this is not unlike other pollutants that we've had in the past, like say DDT, which is a chemical pollutant, which we did ban. <coughs> it was persistent, it was accumulating, it was harming <coughs> wildlife, and it was traveling the globe. And plastic is very much like that. Um, and then just one other clarification on the dog poop bags. <laughs> I actually bury my dogs poop not near my vegetable garden um, and I, I do have a little bit of a struggle with this but there are compostable bags and if a bag is certified compostable then it should break down um, not always in a landfill but in a municipal composting facility so that's complicated but there's a lot of confusion about that because there's degradable bags which so those break down in, into smaller pieces of plastic and it's the microplastics that really are, are harmful and right. can even attract other pollutants in a marine environment, mm -hmm. such as persistent organic pollutants that are already there can pull them out. And, and, and the microplastics can be a way for those existing pollutants to enter the food chain. So- Because the microplastic becomes a carrier? So I'm added by the list environmental impacts, persistence in the environment, um, and health impacts. Um, okay, great. And if you have uh, information that you think the committee might want to look at, if you send us an email and put links in or something like that, we'll happily add it to our, our growing section of the website that includes all our plastics testimony. I, th I brought in a few weeks ago those uh, biodegradable <laughs> plastic bags from my co op, but apparently they've been thrown out. I hate uh, mine. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> I probably left mine around the wrong place. But, um, and I apologize for being out. I got called out for a few minutes. Has there been any discussion about those uh, and uh, the ability to, and the cost of replacing um, with the biodegradable, or does it turn out that you use more corn? And Fertilizer, mm -hmm. or you know what, what the, those various trade are, trade offs are. I mean, they usually are corn, right, Jim? Yeah, the, yeah. The, a lot of the bio, like the biotello, is um, is corn, corn based. So that it, that's not ideal right. either. And then probably right. most of them don't get composted because they're really only compost compostable right. in a facility, and we don't have enough facilities. Right. We're lucky to have that in Chittenden County, but not everybody. 
term biodegradable, I'm not, I mean, so this is where we need to get under the hood of legal definitions of things. I'm not sure what biodegrade means. Does it mean it turns into smaller and smaller pieces to which it's still persistent? Or does it mean it goes back to constituent molecules that can then re enter the uh, uh, right, so chain, wave of life? So compostable has standards around it. It has to break down into these um, into these elemental um, compounds that would enter back into a natural environment within a certain amount of time under certain conditions. So there's there are standards for that. Whereas biodegradable is kind of more like the word natural. Like there's there's not you know like a piece of wood is biodegradable, but you're not going to put that in your Home compost pile and expect it to break down along with your finance. Okay. Um, anyone else in the room have any comments on our, either the composition of the group or the topics they're charged to look into? Right. So I hand over there. Well, I was just going to add the, the other issue with. If you can just identify your. I'm Judith Albert from Randolph. I'm sorry. I didn't it. Judith Augsburg from Randolph. Um, the additional uh, issue with biodegradable or uh, I'm not sure the compostable is the chemicals that are added to these biodegradable bags that are actually perhaps just as dangerous as uh, to you know to putting your compost. Uh, Anything else that's chemical, so you don't want to put those in your compost. I think you're thinking of degradable. <coughs> right. And that's it's, they're that. just degradable, which means they break down in smaller pieces of plastic, which are maybe okay if you run out of but not. And that's part of the problem is that not uh, consumers don't understand yeah. all the different classifications, and we even even the compostable stuff yeah. doesn't compost unless you're composting it properly. Right. You, um, UVM is using um, entirely a starch-based uh, set of uh, forks and knives for their cafeteria, and I believe they're moving to their um, patients as well. Has the problem of kind of getting soft, like we've talked, you've talked about. Um, but again, the question is, how much do we know about what's actually in these kind of alternative products? that we're eating with. Right. <laughs> they, they actually are a fairly big piece of litter on UVM's campus, these shards of... And what's wrong of, with uh, real silverware? I would prefer real, real silverware. Okay. Uh, I just teach the class. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> you don't make crazy. food policy? Well, I think one issue is that students... They're, Grab and they're th yeah. They take them, yeah. it, or they end up in the trash, and so it's expensive. Mm -hmm. But the... There are lots of green little shards of these mm. pieces of color. Not good. Too many people. Good, good, good yeah. pandemic. Good, good solid pandemic. pandemic. Okay, my name is Lindy Sargent from Martin, <coughs> and I work uh, with the Gump organization. But I one of the people on your committee might be somebody that's in education, because I really, I, you know, I'm always impressed by the young people who are um, coming in and really setting the setting the pace for what we all need to do. And I think that education in terms of like, we all need to know what is biodegradable and what does that really mean, and we do need to know what we can recycle because it varies across the state. And I'm just thinking long, longer term changes in, in solid waste management so that we could have communities be more involved in educating the, their population and doing things like if you wonder how to get your eggs eggs home, you, you go to your neighbor who grows eggs. I mean, we're lucky in Vermont that we have a lot of that. And you bring your your uh, egg carton, and you bring your uh, you know your uh, mug of coffee that you bring from home, and you use that when you go to the movie theater. So I, that's just an area I'd like to see happening more. Definitely some more public health then. <coughs> um, yeah, I think that, uh, on your educated comment, but, uh, oh, the, I think his name is Brian Moreland, the representative from the city of Battleboro, mm -hmm. 
that came up and talked to us. When he said one of the things that happened with their program was it was very successful and surprisingly few hiccups in the whole thing. And when we asked him why, he thought it was because they did an extended period of very active outreach and education to both the retail community and to uh, citizens of the town. So by the time the ban went into effect, uh, it was really not a surprise for anyone, and almost everyone is ready to go on the next day. So, so thanks for that. All right. Uh, any other suggestions? Uh, well, so Ms. Jameson, you've been listening to all this. Uh, are we leaving out anyone out from the panel uh, so far that you can think of? And because you know this world better than I think the rest of them, certainly the committee. Right. Uh, with respect to the panel and who yeah. should be on it, I think we've got a, a good list. Okay. I, think, I think all the stakeholders are represented. And in terms of the charge to the committee, you know, you've heard the thing for okay. accumulating. I, I, I'm hearing it, it get longer and longer and longer, and, and the one challenge will be, you know, this is a one summer? Right. How many summers are we doing? Right. But, it, it'll be challenging to address a large number of issues in a one summer committee. So I would be judicious on um, what what um, charge you give the committee. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing too is, you know, in terms of um, imagining we're going to, we'll be asking for recommendations, even for possible like how to draft legislation or stuff like that. And one of those things might be that we need to have an ongoing process that would keep on working through all these other details that we couldn't necessarily get to it. Is that right? So my question about these summer study committees always goes back to, so if the summer study committee comes to the legislature and says, this is what we found out, this is what we recommend, then we start holding uh, testimony. Do we end up jumping through all the same hoops we would have jumped through Without the expense and workload of the summer study committee, sometimes I mean, some sometimes yes and sometimes no. But I find a lot of times the the study committee comes back and the legislature basically looks at the report and starts from scratch, anyways. And so I've never been a big fan of the summer study committees, though some of them have come back with some good and relevant information. A lot of them seem to me to be a, kind of a waste of taxpayer money. So it's an interesting observation given what's going upstairs with F two fifty right, right now. Right, exactly. I mean, although I, you know, I, I'm glad we met this summer and we did this work, but it does. It seems to me, and again, just anecdotally, when I'm hearing, they're kind of repeating the process. So, so does it make more sense for us to just figure a, out I, how to schedule in the process and do it? And then we ask all the experts that we want to ask. I'm just, I've never been a big fan of the summer studies. Um, the other thing that, or just to make sure they're so directed that, again, to Senator Rogers' point, it's if we're getting information, we're going to take that rather than repeat what he's saying, the whole process, because I could see us bringing all those people back in. Well, right. so it's kind of uh, the point, I mean, the most successful ones I've seen were charged with very specific deliverables, mm -hmm. like draft legislation, for instance, I think is the closest. It means you come in. It gives you the foundation of a bill. And yes, you'll end up taking testimony, but though uh, it reminds me of when people are cooking, you know, get all your ingredients prepared, ready, and then you you don't start. To, you don't <coughs> turn on the stove and then go to the grocery store. You you get everything. You know, I'm just wondering there could be some certain questions specific to the group. You know, that yeah. again we could get and we could again. Can't take their word. So anyhow, right. So I'll work with yeah, uh, Mr. Grady, get an extract, and then we can respond to that. I'm not, I'm not interested in wasting time or yeah. money for sure. But I agree. We'll have. We'll end up with the responsibility at the end of the committee to hear enough testimony to validate any kind of recommendations we would hear anyway. So there's going to be some duplication. The question is, uh, can we do it? Effectively. Okay. Uh, you have your hand. Um, I'm hoping this is due to the bounce again. I'm hoping that um, 
that the committee is doing two things at once, which is um, taking the long view, looking for a study, whether it's in the, you know, in our summer committee or in the in this committee. Um, but I also hope, very strongly hope, that there is um, a push and uh, uh, hope, I hope, that this committee and the whole legislature will move to very specific uh, action this year, hopefully, if not, you know, on um, the bag issue and on um, straws. And it's not because those particular things are the absolute um, thing to solve right now. As we are a drop of, we all know we're a drop in the bucket as far as um, the ecology of the world goes. But my sense is that if we, as, as Senator McDonald said, if we can't move <laughs> on such kind of tangible, reasonable solutions that we all kind of agree on, um, if we can't do that, I just don't see any hope for dealing what's coming down the, the pipe with the broader, much more, much huger issue of global warming. Water, you know, more pollution, agriculture, all of it. And I think that that is what the youth is looking for. They're looking for some kind of action that says, aha, we're taking a step. And so, do it. Do bags, <coughs> do straws, do, you know, the, the, uh, the styrofoam, if it's doable in your bill this time, um, because it will mean a great deal to all, you know, to a lot of us. <coughs> and with that, unless there's any other comments from the committee, um, we are done for today. So thank you, everyone.